Uh, welcome to the second day of the Economics of Payments conference. We are soon about to start the, the third session. I want to make the housekeeping issues already before the three o'clock so that we can win the time for the presenters. So my name is Matti Helkvist and I'll be hosting the, uh, the conference here at the Bank of Finland and also chairing this third session. So let me revisit the housekeeping issues first. Uh, please keep your microphones muted uh, unless you are given the floor and similarly keep your camera off. Uh, if you want to make a question and we encourage you to do so, if you have questions, uh, please use the chat uh, and ask for the floor there. The session chairs will, will moderate the, the discussion and give you the floor if the time allows. There is time reserved for, for discussion in all the sessions today. Uh, and also, at the end of the day, we have that uh, informal session. So if you have uh, still questions and if you have possibility to, to stay and join also that informal part, so please do so. Discussion is also encouraged in, in social media. And uh, if you post something in social media, is uh, use the hashtags which we have the hashtag which we have also the, also on the slide as you see it hashtag economics of payments so that we can collect uh, the theme together there uh, today in the conference we are going to have two sessions the first one starting very soon about uh, financial market infrastructures more traditional ones and then the second one uh, on uh, fintech and distributed FMIs. The day will be concluded by keynote presentation by Professor Christine Parlour. The agenda, as you know, is visible on the, on the public internet pages of the Bank of Finland, of the conference, and all the presented papers are available on a separate site. Um, for the registered participants, the link to that site has been sent uh, most recently yesterday before the beginning of the conference with an email, email with the title Welcome to the Economics of Payments X conference. So you will find it from your inbox. But now let me move on to the first session of today. Uh, we will have four interesting papers looking at very different aspects of financial market infrastructures. Uh, the first one presented by Professor Evangelos Benos from University of Nottingham. Uh, is, I would say, a pioneering work comparing intraday liquidity and its determinants across uh, multiple large value payment systems. Second, uh, Kasper Korpinen from the Bank of Finland presents a study on liquidity implications of transition to instant payments in retail systems. Third one, uh, Vladimir Sokolov from the Higher School of Economics presents a study of uh, real-world implications of uh, problems in, in payment system. And finally, the paper presented by Mark Patrick from the US Treasury Office of Financial Research is titled Assessing the Safety of Central Counterparties. We will have a discussion for all the papers, uh, a joint one for the last two ones. And the speakers will have 15 minutes time each discussants uh, five minutes and uh, we try to reserve five minutes for interaction. So indeed, please raise questions in the chat. But uh, now without any further ado, uh, let us move on to the first presentation. So Evangelos, uh, please, the floor is yours. You can take control and then the slides are there ready for you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Mati, and uh, I hope uh, you can hear me. Uh, yes. Thank you very much, excellent. Thanks to the organizers for having our paper. Uh, as Mati said, we have 15 minutes, so I'm going to be uh, a little bit um, quick. I'm going to have to skip some slides, perhaps. Uh, but just to say that this is a joint work with uh, economists from several central banks from many different jurisdictions. The usual uh, disclaimers apply. and. Um, uh, here are the authors. Uh, so uh, let's dive right in. And uh, what we do in this paper is we look at intraday liquidity. 
Now, intraday liquidity uh, arises in uh, large value payment systems or VPSs because settlement of payments is on a gross basis and therefore participants uh, need to prefund these payments. This can happen by either tapping on their own reserves balances or by borrowing from the central bank on an intraday basis or uh, by recycling uh, existing payments in the system. So one of the first questions we ask is how much intraday liquidity is actually being used in these LVPSs? And then once we've established that, we ask uh, how does this consumption and usage of LVPS depends on participant behavior? And then a further question that's perhaps the most interesting aspect of this, of this study is how does this behavior ultimately uh, correlate or uh, depend upon institutional characteristics and features that are present in every LVPS? And there are several examples uh, that we study and we look at, for example, incentives for early payment uh, or the particular re liquidity regime that the central bank happens to be using for providing intraday credit or uh, some uh, features of the liquidity saving mechanism. So uh, as you can imagine, this is something that requires information uh, across jurisdictions and across systems. And this is uh, our first attempt, so as to speak, to uh, try to tackle some of these questions. Uh, I'm going to uh, skip some slides, as I said. So going straight to the variables that we use in this, uh, in this analysis, uh, we first try to assess the measure intraday liquidity. Uh, we, of course, measure as well the aggregate value of payments in every system and on a daily basis. Intraday liquidity usage is going to be the sum of the intraday liquidity that's, that's used by every participant in those systems. And the individual specific uh, intraday liquidity usage is going to be uh, the maximum net debit position for that participant uh, for that particular day. So once we've done that, once we have the aggregate value of payments and the intraday liquidity usage on a system by system basis, we then define this liquidity efficiency measure as the ratio of these two uh, variables, which essentially tells you how what value of payments you can make for every dollar of uh, liquidity that you actually get to use. And by the way, as a parenthesis here, I'd just like to say that uh, these payments are all have been converted to US dollars just to facilitate comparison across systems. So this is the intraday, uh, intraday liquidity usage variables. Uh, we also have some uh, variables for uh, system activity uh, by participants. We have a timing variable, which is the average time at which uh, participants settle their payments and it's value weighted. And we also have a measure of dispersion which is to say uh, how coordinated or how dispersed these payments are within a given day. Uh, this dispersion measure, as you can see here, is based on the specific timing percentiles of the payments that are being made. Uh, if these percentiles are close to each other, this means that participants tend to make these payments within a relatively short uh, time period within during the day and, we, and therefore are less dispersed and more coordinated. Uh, so this is, these are the variables essentially that we use uh, in, in this analysis, payments, intraday liquidity, the ratio, which is efficiency, uh, essentially, and then to uh, timing and to behave to, to, to activity variables, which is timing and dispersion. Uh, the data is the unique bit of our work and uh, it consists of raw messages from specific uh, jurisdictions. These are aggregated at the system level. So for every system, we end up having a time series of daily variables. And then these daily variables are pulled together to create this uh, sizable panel, which comprises nine different jurisdictions. And that's where we do uh, our analysis. So in terms of intraday liquidity usage, the key uh, punchline here is that it's substantial. You can see in, uh, in uh, we have in this chart the payments and intraday liquidity usage for our two largest systems, uh, Fedwire and, uh, uh, and Target2. Uh, for these systems, the daily averages are around 630 and $443 billion on a daily basis. And for the entire sample of our systems, this is about 15% of payment values or 2.5% of these countries and jurisdictions GEPs. So quite substantial magnitudes, economically significant variables. Uh, 
liquidity efficiency. Uh, this, the interesting uh, thing and the key takeaway from liquidity efficiency, which again, I remind you is the ratio of payments made to liquidity used, is that it varies quite substantially both over time and across uh, jurisdictions. Uh, so you can see, for example, that uh, in some systems it's below 10, it's around 5. In other systems it's quite, quite higher at around 10. And you also have some systems where this is changing over time. So one of the key questions we'll be asking is what is driving this? Uh, and in terms of uh, if you look at, for example, at dispersion uh, across systems, again, you have a substantial amount of uh, uh, you have a substantial amount of variation both in the cross section and over time. So uh, this is perhaps a, a bit of a spoiler alert. It turns out that dispersion is going to be one of these variables that's driving liquidity efficiency. Now uh, we did uh, say uh, we did mention institutional characteristics as well. And some of the these institutional characteristics that we look at, are going to be the incentives to make early payments, uh, whether the central bank requires, can extend intraday credit on an on uncollateralized basis or at least at a lower collateral cost. And then we have a number of different LSM features that we're looking at. For example, whether the LSM functionality can bypass or the LSM algorithm can bypass the FIFO protocol, for example, or whether it can multilaterally offset payments that are, that are waiting in the queue. So what we do then is we take these variables, these characteristics, which by the way, uh, this table shows you that these characteristics vary quite substantially across jurisdictions, which is good for the type of analysis that we want to do. And we do a number of uh, relatively naive regressions, I have to say, in the sense that we start regressing these uh, activity variables on, on institutional features and other uh, variables, explanatory variables of interest. So, and by naive, I mean we don't want to make here any strong statements about causation. Uh, we tend to interpret this more as associations or correlations. So, the first one, we first look at timing. And the key takeaways for timing is that as you increase the opportunity cost of reserves, uh, uh, delays, you know, timing, uh, payments are settled later in the day, right, which is consistent with liquidity hoarding. Higher reserves balances, on the other hand, are associated with earlier uh, uh, with, with an earlier settlement of payments. And also the liquidity saving features of LSMs like FIFO bypass and multilateral, multilateral offsetting are also associated uh, with uh, earlier uh, settlement of payments. Uh, going to uh, the panel regressions for dispersion, what we have here is you know, a number of interesting results. So increases in the opportunity cost of reserves associated uh, with increased dispersion, which is again consistent with liquidity hoarding, because if everyone is trying to hoard on their own liquidity, chances are that the coordination of payments is going to, you're going to have a breakdown in this coordination of payments. Reserves balance is also associated with uh, a reduction in coordination, presumably because there's less of a need to coordinate. Uh, and interestingly, incentives for early payment are associated with more coordination. Uh, the, the nice thing about this result is that incentives for early payment actually don't correlate as much with, uh, with actual timing of payments, but they do correlate with the coordination of payments. And one potential explanation for that is that perhaps participants don't want to don't want to uh, look as if they're deviating too much from what the group or the rest of the participants are doing in the presence of these requirements. Um, I'm going to also uh, say that uh, uh, participants seem to endogenize some of the LSM characteristics. So one example here is that whenever you have multilateral offsetting, that seems to be correlated with increased coordination or lower dispersion. Uh, so if participants, payment participants, did think that uh, it makes more sense to coordinate their payments whenever this functionality is present, then you know that would be a story consistent with these uh, results that we get here. So there appears to be some degree of uh, endogenizing, or at least what we find is consistent with that. Another, another example would be this FIFO bypass functionality, whereby it's associated with a higher degree of dispersion or less coordination. And I would like to remind you that FIFO bypass means that the algorithm in the LSM takes care and optimizes and rearranges the timing and the priority of these uh, payments that are waiting to be settled in a way so as to facilitate and maximize liquidity efficiency. So perhaps one reason we see this result is that 
participants actually uh, look at this functionality and think there's less of an incentive to coordinate their payments if the functionality is going to take care of that. Finally, we have some regressions on liquidity efficiency. And I'm not showing you the results again because I don't have as much time, uh, but I would like to get to the main points. So the key finding here is that liquidity efficiency is highly, highly correlated with uh, uh, dispersion. So the more dispersion you have, the less liquidity efficient the system is. And a lot of the variables that we discussed already, institutional variables and central bank reserves, for example, they seem to have uh, this, they seem to be correlated with uh, liquidity efficiency, ultimately via, via this dispersion metric that we calculate. Now, the other interesting thing is that uh, the presence of an LSM on its own does not seem to be statistically correlated with liquidity efficiency. One potential reason for that is that uh, maybe these LSMs are not as used as heavily during our sample time because of an abundance of reserves in, uh, in many systems uh, because of quantitative easing programs. Unfortunately, we don't observe LSM usage, so we cannot directly test this uh, hypothesis. Or it could be alternatively that different features of LSM seems to seem to have perhaps could have uh, uh, offsetting effects on payment behavior on, on, uh, on LVPS participant activity, which could offset some of the desired and intended effects of LSMs, like, for example, the FIFO bypass uh, functionality that we discussed. So uh, to conclude, and I think I'm I managed to finish this within 15 minutes, here are what we think are perhaps some policy relevant conclusions that start to emerge uh, from this analysis. First of all, uh, intraday liquidity usage is hugely important for financial stability because it's economically very significant. Funding markets, what happens in funding markets in terms of the opportunity cost of reserves also matters for payment system activity. It's correlated, uh, you know, higher funding costs are correlated with lower coordination, uh, and lower liquidity efficiency. QE, QE seems to have, uh, is also correlated with what happens in payment systems. We see payments being processed earlier and we see an increase in dispersion. LVPS rules, like, for instance, the incentives to make payments, uh, seem to have some effects, perhaps not the effects that one would expect, because the variable that's being influenced is the degree of coordination rather than the average settlement time. And finally, it looks as if that uh, uh, specific LSM design features uh, seem to correlate with some of these variables we, we discussed and ultimately with intraday liquidity usage and its efficiency. Uh, it could be the case that potentially uh, system participants may be endogenizing some of the effects and some of the characteristics of these LSMs, thus potentially undoing some of these intended effects. Going forward, I'd just like to take this opportunity and uh, say that uh, the group is still open to additional central banks uh, that would like to join the group and add their own data. Uh, the more data, the better, as far as these types of analysis are concerned. And uh, the group is continuing to work on uh, refining a little bit our analysis and looking at new areas of interbank and LVPS activity. And with that, I would like to thank you all for the opportunity to present our work. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you very much, Evangelos, uh, uh, also for a very timely kept uh, schedule. So now we can give the floor to the discussion, to, uh, uh, and that will be Shui Kobayakawa from uh, Meiji University. So good evening to Tokyo. Please, the floor is yours. So, uh, thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to comment on this excellent paper. And my special thanks go to the organizers of the conference as well. And many congratulations to those who have been involved over years to, uh, in this remarkable achievement. Um, the, to start with, um, I don't think I can uh, need, see the... You will need to press the take control to be able to change the slides. There's the take control button. Okay. okay. Now you can change the slides. You should be able to change the slides now, so, <coughs> yes. Okay, yeah. so to start with, um, I uh, very much like the paper and would like to congratulate authors, uh, many of whom I have known
for years over the CPMI related works. They have made uh, tenacious efforts to compile data and produce such an extraordinary outcome. And this evening, I thought I might as well look at the Japanese data and try to provide some perspectives from Asia, which is part of the world anyway. Um, the chart on uh, page three shows what intraday liquidity usage looks like in Japan. Bars indicate the outstanding balance of intraday overdrafts, and the line shows its ratio relative to the settlement value via BOJNS, the real-time gross settlement in Japan. Overall, the ratio remains around 5.3%, which is significantly less than 15% the average across the systems in the paper. Um, I wondered why uh, this was the case. Um, maybe it was due to prolonged uh, quantitative easing or quantitative and qualitative easing in Japan. As you know, the Japanese banks have been awash with liquidity, hence they rely less on intraday liquidity from the central bank. But then when I looked at the figure two in the paper, I realized other large economies, such as the United States and the Euro area, also register somewhat lower ratio relative to others. So Japan was not an outlier after all. And I stress there is a large divergence amongst countries. That is exactly what makes this paper so interesting and so intriguing. The, um, the page five, that said, um, I wondered what this ratio, the liquidity ratio really means to us. In the Japanese context, almost 95% of aggregate payment values are settled by reserves, not by intraday liquidity. So you can talk about the efficiency of intraday liquidity by measuring this ratio. But the efficiency of overall liquidity needs to take account of to what extent reserves are efficiently used. So ultimately, that is what matters to uh, commercial banks. Secondly, it seems to me that there are many forces that drive the liquidity ratio in opposite directions. On one hand, the higher the reserves, the less incentive for banks to coordinate. Hence, they rely um, more on intraday liquidity and Q goes down. This is the storyline in the paper, and I fully agree. On the other hand, quite simply, higher reserves require less intraday liquidity because banks have more liquidity at hand, and Q is likely to go up. So these competing forces uh, must have become more acute as ultra easing continues. Uh, thirdly, the fact that some economies, including Japan, uh, conduct negative interest rate policy might complicate the interpretation of Q ratio even further, as reserves are no longer free money. So it will be interesting to see to what extent these empirical findings might change before and after the QE. The next topic I wanted to touch on is about early settlement. The page six, uh, this uh, the, the diagram shows that the cumulative share of BVP settlement for JGB, the Japanese government bonds transactions. Over the years, it has been a convention in Japan to finish the lion's share of settlement before noon so that people can enjoy relaxed lunch. This picture has not materially changed even after quantitative easing. And one of the reasons behind it is, I guess, the payment pattern among different groups of commercial banks has not materially changed. Uh, this page uh, shows that the Japanese city banks, including MAFG, SMBC, and Mizuho, are the only net payers, meaning that their outgoing payment instructions exceed incoming payment instructions both in terms of transaction volume and transaction value. So for all other banks, including regional banks, credit unions, and internet banks, they have always been net payees. Such a payment pattern facilitates coordination among the chosen few 
Hence, it has been relatively easy for those banks to continue the practice of early settlement, despite this deterring incentives and the quantitative easing. Another aspect that, uh, concerning early payment incentive is how it relates to inter-institutional setup, such as liquidity saving mechanism and the existence of private sector large value payment system. The latter, summarized in this page, is not quite touched upon in the paper, but I find it quite important in the Japanese context. These institutional setups can provide different incentives so LSM uh, could generate an incentive to coordinate now, as alluded in the paper. At the same time, other institutional features, such as the, pri the availability of private sector large value payment system could generate an incentive to coordinate later. To elaborate, uh, this page uh, shows how liquidity saving mechanism works in the Japanese RTGS. It is essentially the combination of bilateral and multilateral netting coupled with queuing mechanism. Under this framework, commercial banks have two options when they want to settle transactions whose value is less than 100 million yen. The first option is to use uh, the central bank's liquidity saving mechanism, but this creates a kind of uncertainty with respect to the timing of settlement, because in some cases, payment instructions are netted bilaterally, but in other cases, they are put in the queue and wait until they can be netted multilaterally or put, put back in the bilateral netting. The second option for banks is not to rely on the BOJ net, but use the Zengin system, which is the, uh, the uh, DNS system operated by the Japanese Bankers Association. Under the Zengin system, all the instructions are being cleared and settlement at a single point of time, i.e. 3.30 p.m. So if banks are not in favor of uncertainty in terms of settlement timing, they might resort to DNS, hence creating an incentive to pay later rather than pay now under the RTGS. So to sum up, this story highlights the importance of looking at the interplay between RTGS and other systems. Uh, what incentive the existence of multiple payment infra infrastructures might generate for players? Other suggestions, including that it might be beneficial to collect data, not only from Europe and the Americas, but also from uh, Asia. So I very much welcome the, uh, the speakers uh, the comments uh, in his presentation. And finally, I have always wanted to stress how important it is to have payment statistics in the BIS data warehouse. And I want to suggest that the BIS might consider expanding the data, uh, the set of data in the Red Book statistics by incorporating some indicators compiled in this paper. So this is the end of my discussion. And once again, many thanks for inviting me to speak today and my warmest congratulations to the authors of this paper whose further insights will surely benefit all of us here today. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Shui, for, for the comments and remarks. Uh, I'm looking for for having questions in the, in the chat, but uh, as there are not yet any, I just um, comment myself that I was wondering, based on the analysis, what could be the best ways to impact the dispersion, which you mentioned as one of the key variables. But it seemed to me that Shui also mentioned one solution, and was to agree a culture of uh, paying most of the payments before lunch, which seemed to be the, the practice in Japan. <clears throat> but. Um, there were very good comments and remarks from Shui, and as I see no uh, comments raised in the chat, I think uh, we say thanks, sir, and we continue and keep the timing uh, and move on to next presenter now. So that would be Kaspere Korpinen uh, from Bank of Finland and moving on to instant payments. So Kaspere, you can take the control. <laughs> yep, thank you. Yes. 
Hi everyone, I'm using another screen, so I will not be looking at the camera all the time. Sorry for that, but um, it's a convenience for me. Uh, so this is, um, we'll be presenting on a paper we made with uh, Matti Halkvist uh, together. So we have both authors are online. Um, so shortly saying, uh, first we'll have a short overview on the goal, then on the model setup, uh, the generation of the data. And finally, I will present the results on the liquidity needs and the regression model. So, uh, motivation apart is that um, uh, the euro system is very committed uh, to instant payments, and uh, the transition has, uh, you can say, has already started. Uh, one issue is that uh, we don't know exactly what are the liquidity risks involved, and these are questions that have been set out. And uh, more specifically, we are answering to this uh, question regarding what are the liquidity need implications of uh, transition towards uh, instant payments. So we, we, are, uh, we have analyzed the Finnish market, and we try to provide an, an answer on, on from this perspective. Uh, Finnish market is dominated by two ancillary systems, Step 2 and RT1. Uh, we know that uh, beginning of January, 10% actually um, of the payments have already uh, migrated to RT1, which is an instant payment system. Uh, step 2 migration is also ongoing, but um, we don't know exactly what is the situation now, but at least uh, uh, from the situation where we were. Um, there is a specificity with uh, step two and the Finnish market is that we operate with uh, six uh, batch cycles during the day. So the, during those batches, uh, data is uh, payments are accumulated and uh, they are settled on a batch basis. So only the net liquidity needs are, are settled at the end of each cycle. Uh, the data we have uh, in hand uh, dominates a lot our study, and um, we do not have uh, single payments, but we do have monthly statistics. Uh, we, so what we have is that we have um, a distribution of um, the payment size by category, which uh, you can see on the box on the on the right, um, and then we have. Uh, statistics on values and volumes sent and received by participants for each uh, daily cycle. Yes. So, uh, what we needed to do uh, for our study is to generate uh, transactional data. Uh, and for this, we adopted a strategy <laughs> that uh, we want to estimate the transactions based on this uh, different uh, aggregate um, information. Uh, and we decided to choose um, a log normal distribution for the value of the payments. Uh, the log normal decision is actually based on the data itself. So if you look at the data uh, form of the distribution of the values of the data, they, they look like they are log normally distributed. And uh, this also provides uh, pretty good results. Uh, for the time distribution, we have used a Poisson distribution. Um, in the study for the data, uh, we match the values and payments of sent uh, volumes, sent transactions. So the, uh, the values of the sent payments are matched, as well as the quantity of them on the bank level and by cycle. For the receiving side, uh, we had to choose that we are matching or aiming uh, the calibration for for the received value. Uh, this is a well uh, uh, defended uh, decision as uh, aiming for for the value is actually providing better results. Uh, we first tried to to aim for uh, matching the number of received payments, but that led to uh, not to so, so good uh, results simply. Uh, two different topologies have been uh, produced or generated. So we can uh, look at, from the next slide. We see so we have an even distribution uh, topology, and then we have a very concentrated network. So altogether, we have uh, two two um, sets of uh, transactions. So 1,000 simulation 
1,000 days of generated data for each uh, different topology, uh, which uh, which we do compare. Uh, uh, one, one result is that uh, we found out that uh, there is no big difference between uh, from the, the study questions of, of our study point of view, there is no big difference between these two networks. So the results are based on the even distribution topology. Uh, to get a holistic view on where do we stand from a liquidity consumption perspective on a system level, we st uh, started the study also by making a comparison that uh, how much is the actual level of liquidity needed uh, at different cycle, um, using different uh, cycles. And we can see that uh, starting with uh, one cycle, this means that we have only one batch for one day. So every pay, all the payments are kind of uh, settled once at the same time uh, during one day. And we observed that naturally uh, we have the lowest liquidity consumption uh, with this kind of uh, system setup. And um, <clears throat> what we can also see is that when we move uh, to a settlement type where we have two cycles for the whole day, we already observe a very important uh, increase in the liquidity consumption. Uh, here we can see the same uh, liquidity consumption levels for the different cycle amounts. So we increase step by step the amount of uh, cycles used and we end up uh, with the last one, which corresponds to the instant payment mode. So no cycles at all used or batches. So we see that 65% of the total a liquidity increase already occurs when moving from one cycle to two cycles. When we look at our uh, data, uh, we can we can observe that um, this is uh, on the participant level. So one dot corresponds to a participant uh, for a day. Uh, we plot it against. We have the a settlement with uh, six cycles, so this, which corresponds to the current um, normal uh, settlement uh, method used to a full instant uh, mode on the left cycle. And we can observe that every time we have a dot that is above the zero line or 45 uh, degree line, we see that there is a liquidity increase. We can also see that uh, from the cumulative curve that uh, most of the observation, they pile up on the lower end. Uh, this is maybe one, one of the important observations um, for explaining what makes the increase in, in liquidity needs when moving to instant payment or, or full gross settlement in a certain sense, um, is that uh, where there is more netting occurring with the cycles, there is also more potential for a liquidity increase. So for payments uh, or participants that already use more liquidity or or are like already uh, strongly, um, let's say that they have a big net position, so they're strongly paying out or receiving payments, they are likely to observe a smaller uh, liquidity increase when moving to instant payment modes because they already are net payers or net receivers. Uh, here is a we have plotted uh, the two uh, the results for the two different topologies. So uh, we have the on, on pink you have the even distributed topology. Uh, on on the blue you have the concentrated network topology. And we can observe that these coincide very much. Their average values are the same, and uh, we conclude that uh, they produce the same same. Um, projections uh, for liquidity increases. This is a quite interesting outcome and we kind of find it also uh, intuitively correct. So what we can say about this is that on a system level, 95% uh, of the cases lead to a liquidity need increase of less than 8.7%, which corresponds to 28 million. So it's gonna be somewhere here. So 95% of all simulated days are on the left side. But we can see that there are also some uh, high value observations for some days. In average, this means that uh, 
for the days we observe a 2.7% or 8.6 million liquidity need increase. So precisely, like I said, one of the outcome of the study that we were pretty astonished first was that uh, the topology does not impact the liquidity needs. And a reason reasons for that is that uh, indeed, but when we think about it for liquidity needs, it doesn't matter whom you are paying or from whom you are receiving. It's uh, more the timing does matter though, but uh, not with whom. Um, one other reason why we do not uh, need actually this topology information is precisely we are not using it for this study. Uh, if you would be doing some studies like stress scenarios where topology starts to matter, uh, th then this, uh, the situation is different. Also, we make this uh, assumption that all banks migrate to instant payment mode in one go. And uh, that also makes that the whole payment material is in use at the same time. If you would be uh, simulating a transitional um, let, let's say a timely transition that we we are not going in one go, that uh, we have part of the payments in one system, the other in the other, they are coming late. Uh, then we will be uh, dealing with a partial network anymore. And then the topology of the network would most likely matter again. Um, yes, yeah, so to complete the study, uh, we had this idea that um, we would um, uh, produce a regression model uh, partly also uh, to understand to see what the data uh, tells us uh, from the regression point of view but also uh, in order to provide a model uh, to predict liquidity needs uh, on a participant level for a specific cycle and um, using uh, two, uh, a stepwise uh, regression uh, methodology uh, so you, well this uh, kind of tattoolment process uh, for those who are not uh, uh, familiar with uh, stepwise processes is um, that uh, in, the, in the first approach we added variables. So one, two, three, four, five steps. In different steps we run for each variable combination, we rolled, uh, run the full, uh, full regression, observe the results, the R values, so on. And uh, according to a decision uh, criteria, we include uh, new variables or exclude. What is important uh, to know this here that uh, two strategical approaches for the stepwise process were used. So one going from one to uh, to increase the amount of explanatory variables and the second one uh, was coming down from a more holistic set of different variables, uh, also their cross terms, uh, square roots and, and so on. Uh, and both approaches led to the same uh, outcome. So the number five here uh, with the same explanatory R squared value. Uh, so this is the strongest uh, strongest uh, regression uh, obtained with the two approaches. Or so, yeah, we can also observe that the explanatory levels of the variables are actually pretty high. So three stars accounts for uh, 99.9 uh, uh, level of um, uh, percent level of uh, confidence and um, and the two dots is a uh, 99 percent and um, w well with one star we don't even have but uh, yeah so these are very strongly explanatory also what is nice is that the coefficient sign of the coefficients uh, are plausible so they make sense uh, if you look at this uh, for example through the example uh, so here we have two uh, hypothetical examples what this means in practice. So we have bank one, we have another bank uh, in the same cycle. Uh, we have same value for the payments, but we have different net positions um, in thousands of euros. So we see here uh, this bank one is a uh, was able to to have a better uh, netting performance uh, in the uh, batch mode. And uh, here we can see that the bank two is definitely more, it has a stronger net position. 
Uh, liquidity recycling is way stronger for Bank One. And also the amount of number of cent payments is less than for Bank Two. And uh, here we can observe the predicted, sorry, the predicted uh, difference in, um, in the liquidity need increase. So the more there is netting, uh, the less there are payments. And the stronger the liquidity recycling is, uh, the more likely we are to uh, observe a bigger uh, liquidity increase, liquidity need increase. So to summarize all, is uh, we uh, we expect some uh, liquidity increases uh, uh, to op to occur, but still relative relatively small, uh, as uh, most of uh, the liquidity. Um, saving benefits we lose already uh, very early on if you remember uh, that with the one cycle was two cycles um, then then again uh, we build the model to with which we can kind of um, uh, ex not extrapolate but uh, predict the likelihood or magnitude of a liquidity increase on a participant level uh, we notice also that the topology of the network for this type of analysis does not matter much, at least. Don't know if we can consider it proven yet with our, within our analysis, but, uh, but at least a strong indication uh, towards that. Um, also, one interesting thing that came to our mind that relates also precisely to, to the quantitative easing programs and, uh, and so on, these uh, extraordinary liquidity conditions we are having now. Uh, is precisely that maybe for a transition, this is the perfect timing to, to go. And um, just because precisely there is already a lot of extra liquidity, so it's not likely to cause that much costs maybe to banks uh, currently in, in the current uh, setup. Also, the data generation analysis uh, provided that we can, we can use this approach uh, when we don't have transactions, to some extent at least. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Kasperi. And uh, then we can move on to the bit discussion uh, for this, this paper. And the discussion will be delivered by Miljana Alexandrova Kabajova from Bank of Mexico. Please, Miljana, you can take control, and the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting me. This is so interesting and uh, so important conference. Um, I'm, I'm very glad that I have to discuss this paper. And to start, I, I would like to say that the enlargement of the online uh, financial space unquestionably has brought new challenges. The global health crisis has accelerated the digital payment ecosystem developments and in such uncharted territory, banks and other traditional financial service providers has focused on P2P transactions, which in the last year has achieved an important growth with fintech and big tech holding a prominent share. The bar has been set for P2P transactions to become an instant payments. The market needs modern payment infrastructures that enables friction real-time pay payment, deal with interoperability, and provide solutions for multiple rails working together. The paper of Matti Helvix and Kasper Karpanen fits nicely in the line in the literature aimed to deliver to policymakers accurate figures and tools for the design and building of those uh, new financial market infrastructures. So the usual, um, I am trying to move to the next slide. Are, are you seeing the next slide? Mm. I don't no, know if I'm, I'm on. I'm wondering if you see there is a flash. 
You, you should be able to move. You have the control. Yes, now we see. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, so the usual disclaimer apply. The view presented are um, not necessarily reflecting the view of Bank of Mexico and their entirely mine views. So, um, currently, in many jurisdictions, retail payments are processed through different uh, deferred net settlement mechanism. So, it's not surprising that the gradual transition in processing retail payments through instant payment schemes system has increased the level of liquidity used for settlement. The paper study how the liquidity needs of fin uh, Finnish banks will be affected if retail transactions in the step two system on the Finnish market are settled as instant payments. The authors generate artificial transaction level data samples using monthly statistics. And the data is calibrated according to the value and volume of submitted transaction and the value of received payments. Um, in the case of full transaction from the current uh, settlement scheme to instant payment processing, the authors estimate that daily liquidity requirements on the system level could increase with no more than 88.6%. And the average increase is calculated at 2.7%. Similarly, the increase of the overall daily liquidity need with, with at most 28 million euros, and the average increase is estimated at 8.6 million euros. A part of the motivation we already explained in the beginning that in the current state, we are moving to instant payments um, not only in particular jurisdiction, but I would say over the world. The study is related to the literature on liquidity needs in settlement system that has been developed in the last decades or so. The paper is well structured and clearly presented. And um, what I noticed when uh, was uh, analyzing the, the results that the amount of additional liquidity is calculated for similar time structure currently uh, cleared in step two. So um, they present uh, the, um, the values settles in different uh, cycles. And I noticed that during um, the ninth cycles, which is the first cycle, uh, the value is uh, highest. So perhaps there is indication that some um, participants uh, deliberately prefer to, to settle some large value payments during the night. So I'm wondering if the time structures of this transaction is different, would be the settlement needed for instant, instantaneously processing this payment will also increase. Because uh, in the case of instantaneous payments, you, you don't have this option to, to kind of wait for another 30 or 45 minutes, perhaps, or even hour. So um, the, the calculation of required funds on a part of, of the time structure is also based on the transition volume without changing. So if the, if the uh, transition uh, volume does not change, it's not surprising that the uh, topology also uh, uh, didn't have a um, prominent role. So my interpretation of the fact that the topology is um, not relevant is because uh, volume in the system does not change. But what if the, uh, the volume of transaction between pairs increase and the rate of the bilateral level is different, means that um, not increase uniformly among all participants, but rather some, uh, some um, participants has um, a higher um, volume be between them. So, to what extent, in your opinion, the heterogeneity in the growth of bilateral transaction value will play a more relevant role of the network topology? And with that, I would like to thank you. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much, Biljana, for the for the comments and remarks. Uh, we are basically uh, 
have used the time for, for this presentation. You had some comments there, but I think we will take note with those uh, and, uh, and uh, continue maybe, maybe bilaterally on that, as I see no further questions raised uh, in the chat at the moment. So thanks, thanks for very good remarks and, uh, and uh, good discussion to Biljana. And uh, now let us move on to, to keep the timing for the session. It's unfortunately tight, but uh, we'll move on. And uh, the next presenter, as mentioned earlier, is uh, Vladimir Sokolov from Higher School of, of Economics. And uh, his paper titled Money Illiquidity is, is the next one. So please, uh, you can introduce your co-authors and uh, the floor is yours, uh, Vladimir. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is a joint work with Dmitry Livdan from uh, Haas Berkeley and with uh, Norman Schurhoff from University of uh, Lausanne, uh, Swiss Finance Institute. Uh, the paper called is Money Liquidity. And we would like uh, to thank the organizers of this uh, conference to uh, include us into the program of this very uh, interesting and useful uh, event. Uh, What's this paper is about, first of all? Uh, we know that the uh, payment system is the backbone of the financial and real economy. Uh, but somehow many financial economists, when they model uh, the exchange of goods and services between firms, uh, they often assume that uh, payment for those goods of, and services are frictionless. So the intermediation uh, is frictionless. However, from um, quite a, uh, big episodes uh, and maybe small episodes uh, in the financial history, we know that this is not <clears throat> the case. For example, the September 11 attacks, the 290, uh, 2019 uh, repo market blow up, and recent uh, problems in March 2020 in the Fed wire uh, demonstrated that uh, disruptions uh, in the ability of firms to pay uh, to each other for goods and services, they matter. Okay. So our approach uh, to handle this uh, question and contribute to the literature is, uh, first of all, to introduce uh, an equilibrium uh, model uh, with endogenous uh, production network formation uh, subject to payment disruptions. And second, uh, provide the empirical evidence using a very granular uh, micro level data, uh, a payment level data between our firms for goods and services. Uh, where we could identify the firm's recipients and senders and control for their characteristics and uh, nicely use the uh, natural type of experiment episode of banking panic in uh, Russian Federation, uh, which uh, disrupted the payment system flows uh, between firms. Uh, our main findings, let us let me briefly preview the main findings. First of all, uh, our uh, theoretical and empirical results show that uh, direct loss of uh, pay, uh, shock to firms' ability to make payments affects the uh, revenue growth of the firm. And there are two channels of this effect, uh, the direct shock to the uh, firm's banks and also shock to banks of firms' counterparties, the downstream and upstream firms to which uh, firm is related. So shocks to the banks of uh, firms uh, who are counterparties of a given firm also uh, matter and also reduce the revenue growth of a given firm. Okay, we show that shocks propagate through these payment systems upstream uh, through the input output network of the firms. And uh, quite importantly, unlike uh, previous literature, we assume that the uh, network structure adjusts. So the uh, centrality of each firms in the network changes after the shock. And then uh, we uh, design uh, the theoretical and the empirical counterparty measure of so-called, we call it resilience. Uh, the theoretical uh, part is uh, derived in the model and empirically uh, we measure it as elasticity of eigenvector centrality of each individual firm. And we show that this uh, uh, variable, constructed variable, uh, would matter. And we will explain how. So empirical estimates uh, show uh, the following results. So they're all highly statistically significant. 
and I will demonstrate the regression outputs later. Uh, but you can see here in the preview that if you uh, separately take shocks to the firm's banks, uh, to banks of the upstream and downstream uh, firm, uh, the biggest negative impact on the given firm's revenue growth is a shock to the banks of the downstream firm, to the, of the customer of a given firm. So if the customer of a given firm uh, is subject to payment system shock, a uh, given firm uh, has the largest uh, drop in uh, revenue growth across two periods before and after the panic. And also we show that this resilience measure, which we uh, de design, uh, has an offsetting result. So the more resilient is the firm, so the less its, uh, the less it's eigenvector centrality changes after the shock. Uh, that's a, a intuitively me measure of its resilience. Uh, the, 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 more, uh, the more upsetting it, uh, effect is on revenue growth, and here it's uh, quantified. So first of all, uh, let me show our, uh, the, the, the basically the structure of our uh, theoretical contribution. So we take uh, the uh, seminal paper by Asimoglu and co-authors uh, of uh, input-output uh, economy, uh, and we do two extensions. We do two contributions to this uh, uh, model. So we introduce, uh, first of all, internal uh, factor of production. So we split in the Cobb-Douglas function uh, factors of production into external and internal ones. And the idea is to demonstrate that those uh, sub uh, factors of production, they're external, uh, they are subject to the payment shock risk. So a firm has to acquire them outside on the market and then if there are uh, shocks to the ability of firm to pay for those uh, factors of production, uh, then uh, it will also has in impact on the output of a firm because it will not be able to produce, uh, secure those inputs. And then uh, we introduce the, uh, besides the traditional productivity shock epsilon in the cop double function, we introduce uh, access to payment shock Z. So uh, ability of a firm to obtain that external factor of production. Uh, 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 the text of our paper has a closed form solution for this uh, setting, uh, but let me just briefly illustrate the flavor, uh, what's important, and then uh, demonstrate the graphical um, illustration of simulation of a model. So what's important here is the uh, something uh, we call eigenvector like centrality, which depends on Leontief inverse, which also depends on the multiplication of these two matrices. One is the matrix of the matrix of those Z shocks, payment access shocks, and then the second one is the weight of those uh, factors of production and the production function. And uh, uh, what our model demonstrates that eigenvector centrality of which firm uh, after those shocks will adjust. So it's, it will be endogenous adjustment of the weighting and of the structure of the network. So here is uh, the numerical simulation. So what we do here, we simulate uh, just random network of nine firms where circles illustrate revenues uh, and uh, blue lines demonstrate, illustrate the uh, flows, payment flows. And on the right hand side, uh, you see the part of the diagram where we will be uh, also showing the change in eigenvector centrality, weighted eigenvector centrality of each firm. So we also for each of these nine firms, we calculate eigenvector, weighted eigenvector centrality in this network. And then uh, uh, after the shock and propagation of the shocks, uh, uh, according to our model, uh, the right-hand side graph will illustrate change in eigenvector centrality of each of these nine firms. So here we hit it uh, firm one with a, a random shock, payment shock. Uh, and then as the shock propagates through the system, uh, uh, we see, uh, well, basically three effects. Uh, one is that uh, revenues of each firm in the network declines, the payment flow uh, declines. But then what's importantly on the right-hand side, we see how centrality weighted eigenvector centrality of which firm changes. And here we have some uh, rather unexpected result. We see that uh, firms uh, two and nine they have the biggest drops in centrality, which one probably could not ex ante uh, predict from looking at the initial structure of the network. But given the uh, logic of the model, uh, just shock to firm one results in the following adjustment of the network. 
and then uh, firms two and nine being the least resilient, and first uh, firms uh, five and seven being the most resilient in our terminology in terms of a change in the centrality of these firms in, in, in the network. Okay, so being armed with this theoretical model, uh, we uh, are able to formulate the full empirical prediction predictions, so a set of predictions. So first one is that uh, the centrality of the uh, average uh, measure of uh, centrality of the whole network of firms uh, will decline after the uh, network uh, is hit by the payment system shock. Okay, so it's an aggregate prediction. Second one is uh, that uh, if one is able to measure uh, the payment shock to each individual firm, we will see that uh, also the firm will be affected in terms of uh, payment uh, uh, growth, the revenue growth uh, coming from other firms uh, over uh, the pre and post panic periods. And then uh, prediction number three is that payment shocks propagate upstream because we are able to measure shocks to each firm. And we see that uh, we, we, we will predict that we will be able to see that uh, revenue growth uh, of a given firm uh, will also be dependent on shocks to uh, its customers and suppliers, upstream and downstream firms. Uh, then uh, finally, two last predictions that deal with this uh, our measures of eigenvector centrality. First of all, uh, our model predicts that more central firms, those which have initially the highest uh, measure of eigenvector centrality, will be more sensitive to the payment system shocks. And uh, very intuitively, this is explained by the fact that in our model, uh, firms uh, maximize uh, their profits and uh, more complex structure of uh, inputs uh, in the production function of a given firm and more shocks to the suppliers will uh, strongly uh, negatively affect the firm's profits. And that's why it, uh, its uh, revenues will drop, uh, uh, the, our empirical measure uh, of firms uh, 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 well-being. And finally, uh, this measure of resilience, which I explained previously, uh, will have an offsetting impact on this uh, payment system shocks. That's our predictions. And let me uh, start with the empirical part of this paper. So payment system data, as you might know, uh, is not so easy to obtain. But fortunately, uh, back in 2004, uh, the payment uh, uh, data from the Moscow branch of the Central Bank of the Russian Federation uh, made it somehow available. Uh, there were several papers coming out from this uh, uh, data, two most important ones by Mironov, it's about uh, tax evasion measurement, and another one by Mironov and Zhuravsky is about um, uh, favors around election periods, so politicians, so basically about political influence uh, through firms uh, to affect elections, so they have a political economy flavor. So uh, we use this data, it's very detailed, uh, it can, just for the year 2004 it contains 100, uh, 133 million records and it's different types of payments, but fortunately there is identifier of the, uh, according to the accounting system, uh, what accounts were debited and credited, so we can identify payments for goods and services. So if we filter, filter out the data and only uh, keep the part which uh, is about firms and payment for goods and services. So then we end up with the following statistics. And what's important is that's a four dimensional data. So each record has a information about the firm sender, firm receiver of a payment and banks which serve the transaction. Uh, senders firms bank and receivers firms bank. And then uh, the data is available because uh, all this is routed through the Moscow branch of the Central Bank of the Russian Federation, which collects this data. So it has all this information. Uh, the uh, volume and the nature of the payment is also available. So uh, what's important for us, uh, what we take as a natural experiments, the type of setting, is that there is also information on interbank loan market and we match it with this payment data. And we know from the classical Allen and Gay model that uh, banks often use the interbank market to uh, co-insure each other against the liquidity shocks, uh, which occur when there is a, uh, a, a surplus or deficit of payment uh, uh, in the banking, in each bank. So uh, 
Uh, this is illustrated by, sorry, uh, this is illustrated by the blue uh, line. So what happened in uh, 2004, uh, we had a banking panic, which was uh, exogenously caused by central bank uh, for the first time implementing the law against uh, terrorism and money laundering. It's all of a sudden, all of a sudden withdrew licenses of two uh, mid-sized banks, which happened to be rather central in the interbank market network. And most importantly, uh, the central bank officials being maybe a little bit unexperienced at that time, uh, announced that there are more uh, license withdrawals are coming and uh, there is a black list of banks, uh, which we will also uh, be subject to regulatory uh, checks uh, for money laundering and uh, financing of terrorism. Uh, this is described in paper by Degrees and co-authors. And what we see in the data is the sharp decline in the connections on the interbank market. So banks lost uh, trust in each other and basically ran on each other and uh, severed many connections. So we measure this uh, as a uh, shock to uh, banks' ability to co-insure uh, its liquidity needs. So this graph illustrates uh, the histogram of a change in centrality actually of firms in the network. So because we, we study firms, so we take banks as just uh, uh, how we measure the shock. And here is my our empirical main, main empirical specification. So we collapse the four-dimensional uh, firm bank bank firm data to just firm level data, where uh, each uh, dependent variable is just a gross of uh, payment inflows for a given per firm uh, across six months before the panic and six months after the panic. So it's a gross of inflows for each firm in our sample. A Z is a shock to firms banks uh, measured by loss in the centrality of each bank of the interbank market. And it's weighted uh, because one firm can have several banks, so it's weighted by initial share of each bank in firm's uh, uh, payments. Then second uh, specification is similar one, but it's about shocks to the partners of a given firm. So we add ZD and ZU. These are shocks to the banks of a downstream partners and upstream partners of a given firm I. Okay, so here are main empirical results for the first specification. So it's just uh, each column represents uh, additional uh, level of controls, financial characteristics, banking characteristics. And we show that uh, shock measured as a loss of centrality of firms' banks on the interbank market results in the significant decline uh, in the firms' uh, revenue growth across uh, the two periods. Uh, this uh, scatter plot on the right hand side basically illustrate the logic of column number one in this regression. Uh, so it's just because there are so many observations, there is this bin scatter plot function which allows us to graphically illustrate this negative uh, relationship. And the right on the left hand side is the so called placebo falsification uh, test when we assign the 2004 shock to each firm compare the growth in 2003 in the peaceful period before uh, the panic and we find no uh, discernible pattern so it sort of illustrates the parallel trend assumption which is important to claim causality in this sort of uh, analysis. Uh, this table illustrates uh, the regression results of the second specification where we in addition to the uh, shock to the firms, I firms banks, we add shocks to its partners. Uh, bank uh, to banks of uh, partner firms, uh, the upstream and downstream uh, firms of, uh, to which this firm is connected in the network. And we see, like I already said, uh, the biggest size of the negative coefficient is for the downstream firms, uh, the customers, those which send uh, uh, payments for the output of a given firm, so the final customers. So shock to their banks uh, has the most negative impact on the given firm's uh, revenue flows. And finally, uh, we test our predictions four and five uh, about initial centrality of a given firm in the network before the panic, how it matters, and secondly, how change in that centrality measure, uh, matters. And here is the result of the first uh, regression. So here we just interact our shock to the firm, uh, firm's banks with a firm pre-panic eigenvector centrality. So it's a usual interaction uh, uh, of predetermined variable specification. And we see that all coefficients are negative, uh, suggesting that 
uh, the more initially central firm was, uh, uh, the, 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 the stronger is the impact of a negative shock. So if you, uh, the, the, the strength, uh, so if you increase the cent initial centrality of a firm, the coefficient on, in the first uh, row will increase in its size. Uh, so the, the, the bigger will be negative impact of a shock, which uh, supports our theoretical prediction. And finally, if we measure change in eigenvector centrality across the two periods, our um, measure of resilience to the payment system shock, we find a positive impact on that coefficient. We take two measures. One is symmetric growth, which is explained in the paper, and one is the usual growth. And uh, coefficients are highly significant and positive, meaning that 1% uh, change uh, in the resilience uh, has a 0.8% uh, positive effect on payment growth of a firm. So this will let me conclude. So using, first of all, we modify the standard uh, Asimoglu input-output uh, production network model with two extensions. Then out of those extensions, we make several uh, theoretical predictions. And then using very granular uh, model at the micro level from the Russian Federation, uh, we are able to test those predictions and conclude that payment system shocks matter for firms. They propagate through the payment network and the network adjusts as well. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, uh, you very much uh, Vladimir, Vladimir, for, for the presentation. Uh, and now, as we have the discussion uh, uh, jointly for these two last presentations, we move on directly to the last presentation of the session that will be on CCP. Uh, assessing safety of central counterparties and Mark Patrick, uh, please, the floor is yours. Great, thank, thank you. you. Uh, uh. Change the slides. I'm just waiting for access to the slides. So, so you, you can take control. Um, there's a button in your screen should be take control and then you can change the slides yourself. Or if you prefer, okay. yeah, now, now it seems to work or yeah. good. Okay. Thank you. Apologies is good day. And thank you to the organizers. The work presented today is joint with Peyton Young and summarizes our OFR working paper, assessing the safety of central counterparties is the usual disclaimers apply. Yeah. As central counterparties have proliferated globally, they become a significant intermediary of daily financial market payments post the great financial crisis. This is thus a critical element to them. And, and as a result, we're interested in assessing how prone CCPs are to payment default by assessing the risk management capacity to withstand significant clearing member defaults. Oops. The analysis we'll present today it empirically assesses the potential riskiness of CCPs through three metrics, initial margin breach probabilities, guarantee fund breach probabilities, and default probabilities. The first two metrics capture the likelihood of payment exceedances above pre-funded resources held hold at a CCP, not necessarily the default probability. While finally, the third, 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 third uh, measures the likelihood of the CCP to not fulfill all of its payment obligations, irrespective of necessarily the cause. Let me begin by covering the waterfall of protective elements of a standard CCP for context. CCPs typically have four types of protective resources. The first three listed here pre-funded. The first initial margin covers potential shortfalls in variation margin payments and is held in a segregated account which is supposed to cover variation margin payments with a high probability. This is typically held to a minimum of a 99% bar or span standard following CPMI OSCO principles for financial market infrastructure. The second is CCP paid in capital or skin in the game, which covers losses beyond the contributions of the defaulted member. And finally, the guarantee fund contributions of collective surviving members, which are mutualized. 
This is typically set to a cover standard to default of either one or two participants and their affiliates. Finally, additional resources can be assessed of members or is, if necessary, beyond and what the CCP's paid in capital and guarantee fund contributions cover. However, these funds are likely to be limited and may be difficult to raise in short or notice under periods of stress. The CPSS IOSCO public disclosures provide a quarterly and unified reporting standard on these pre-funded resources. The table here highlights the average percentage of resources held by CCPs by region. And uh, CCPs collect the majority of their funded resources as initial margin as seen here in these segregated accounts typically. While CCPs these also contribute uh, relatively, uh, these are relatively small proportion of the funded resources, especially in Europe and North America. By using these disclosures, we can assess the effectiveness of CCP risk management through the measurement of pre-funded resources ability to cover variation margin payments in the event that there's a significant payment default by member firms and their clients. An initial margin breach occurs when an account's single day variation margin payment owed is greater than the initial whole margin held against that account's portfolio. If the number and size of account initial margin breaches on any one day is significant enough that it creates a guarantee friend breach, which occurs when the sum of initial margin breaches exceeds the mutualized pre-fund resources from the CCP's paid in capital and the aggregate member guarantee fund contributions. This measure supplements conventional standards of risk management and such as the cover one and cover two, and provides a comparative and comprehensive approach of assessing risk protection across CCPs that is not at, at predicated on a specific number of member defaults. Let me first go into the initial margin breach calculation. Using the public quarterly disclosure, is, is they provide the number of initial margin breach events that on an individual account level per quarter. As the, as the average daily bar shows in the table, initial margin breach probabilities are well all in line with CPMI IOSCO principal all minimum standards. Nevertheless, if we look at this on a quarterly probability basis, this, sh this shows the average CCP account breaches once every 10 quarters. In other words, there's a 10% probability that an account suffers at least one breach per quarter. If we further separate this quarterly data with respect to the March 2020 quarter, there was a significant increase in the frequency of IM breaches. The table splits the sample into all quarters prior to the March 2020 quarter or, and those on the quarter. The table highlights the European and North American CCPs saw initial margin breach probabilities more than triple. The result emphasizes the strong positive correlation in periods of stress experienced by CCPs and raises concerns about, about A, the degree of protection and B, the procyclicality in margins that are likely to follow. For example, we saw initial margins increase on average by 30% and across financial CCPs during the quarter, creating additional market liquidity stress. Moving on to the guarantee fund and breach probabilities, we next roll up these initial margin breaches is, and we can assess the overall effectiveness of the pre-funded resources to protect against the aggregate variation margin exceedance of the segregated accounts and mutualized contributions. Now, oh, oh, in the figure here, or we provide the estimate, which is based off of the aggregate variation margin and collected it or, uh, first on the individual account and the increase in initial or margin that changes from day to day. We sum these across the aggregate, and then we can then get an idea of the estimated probability that, that the mutualized resources are insufficient to cover the aggregate amount of exceedances of the initial margin breaches, which we'll call the guarantee fund breach probability. However, since this data is not necessarily available to us, as we have to proxy it using data from the public quarterly disclosures we use maximum aggregate variation margin in payments and initial margin 
breach our initial margin top ups on any single one day to get an aggregate mer aggregate margin call or maximum. Then we compare that to the average initial margin and guarantee fund and collected by those CCPs, is, which allow us to do a comparative ratio, which we'll call our stress index, X, which is, compares the relative aggregate amount of variation margin and payments relative to the pre-funded resources. Thus, anytime we see X exceed one, we assume that a guarantee fund breach would have occurred. We then and take our quarterly samples, pool them together across the CCPs by region, and fit it to a Frache distribution. This distribution, as you can see here, fits quite closely, or the x-axis represents and our x variable, all, all relative to the probability of occurrence. And if we do this by region, we get here, or on the y-axis, the probability of such an event of X occurring and relatively, and if we look at each of the respective regions, we see that the European CCPs generally are the most resilient. Next, the table presented here presents the empirical estimates of these occurrences. We find that not until the first quarter of 2020 in our sample did this type of breach even occur. Additionally, when we use the public data to estimate the likelihood model, or estimated here, of such an event occurring using the fitted regional specific payments distributions, we find that, that the inclusion of the first quarter of 2020 data significantly shifts the quarterly likelihood of guarantee fund breaches. Note, note the highest this occurrence likelihood that exists among North American CCPs with the likelihood of six and a half percent annualized. Once again, we find that these breaches suggest a strong positive correlation in stresses experienced by CCPs during that quarter. Recall, similar to the cover one and cover two standard, the guarantee fund breach does not imply the default probability, rather it signifies a severe stress relative to the resources held against it. However, unlike these cover end measures, our estimate is not predicated on a specific number of members, rather the size of payments and obligations due to the CCP. Finally, using supervisory data, we can estimate CCP default likelihoods. It's using CCAR supervisory data, uh, which is provided on a quarterly level uh, uh, for over 100 CCPs, we have five-year CDS estimates provided by members against the CCPs. These, CC, these CDS spreads, of course, are estimates of the default probability is, is however, or these numbers are not coming from, um, from a market evaluation, rather from members' methodological estimates it's of a CCP's default probability. They, so they should be taken with a grain of salt. However, we do note both that the coefficient of variation among members' estimates of each CCP is relatively low, indicating that they are based on generally an objective measure. So let me show you these numbers first. The table here provides the average annual default probability across all quarters reported. The estimates indicate that generally large CCPs are more well protected than small ones particularly Asian and Pacific and European ones. The larger CCPs is default probabilities range somewhere between two to less than 1%. Additionally, if we look at this in a time series sense, we can also observe the actual shock of the March uh, Q1 and 2020 quarter. We also can see that there's a relatively consistent pattern of ordering among these groups of CCPs. Finally, to conclude, the CCP default would have a systemic consequence and it's due to its losses to members, clients, and spillover effects. Our analysis highlights that large jurisdiction variation does exist between CCP risk management from the public data sources. Larger CCPs are relatively safer as seen in, in both the the guarantee fund breach and the default probabilities we've presented here. High correlation exists among CCP 
policies, risk exposures as measured by the initial margin breaches, guarantee fund breaches, and the default probabilities we've shown here. This suggests that under an extreme stress, multiple CCPs is, might be likely to suffer a default due to network contagion and effects and common exposures, such as what was seen with liquidity shocks. I'll stop there and thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mark, uh, for the presentation and uh, also well timely delivery of, of, of the slides. So we can give the floor to the discussion of the two last presentations. That will be Argiris Kahros from IMF. And you have the floor for 10 minutes and the challenging task of bringing these two risk-related studies together. So please, Argiris. Uh, thank you, Mati. Thank you uh, to the organizers, of course, of the conference. It's one that's uh, dear to my heart. Is one that uh, at least I've been in Helsinki many times for the Bank of Finland Payment Similar uh, System Simulation Seminar, uh, and for this one as well. So it's good to see you guys also virtually. So thank you for the opportunity to discuss these two papers. Indeed, they're quite different, but of course they both tackle the issue of, of safety and resilience, and and even thinking about propagations of, of stress. So I'm going to be discussing these two papers and I'll try to be uh, quite concise. And as you said, I don't have uh, all that much time. So these are the two papers. I don't have to repeat that. So on the money liquidity paper, um, so essentially I'm going to talk a little bit about the background and then the main findings of the paper and then bring up some points for consideration. Uh, payment systems, I, I don't think this audience needs to be told this, are critical components of the financial system. They facilitate transfers of funds between and among participants uh, in major jurisdictions, the payment systems that are also owned and operated by central banks are often uh, key components of, of, um, of monetary policy implementation. So these are really critical uh, systems in the, in the financial system. And uh, if anything, they, uh, as FMIs are typically called the plumbing of the financial system, these are certainly the, probably the most important pieces of that plumbing. So uh, the authors state that the disruptions in payment system functioning can cause illiquidity of money with spillover effects of the real economy. But because spillovers are quite rare, uh, little effort has really been put into studying the possible consequences uh, should payment system disruptions negatively affect economic activity and, and maybe the channels for doing this as well. So as a result, the traditional banking models assume frictionless payment systems. The authors here take an existing model by other researchers and try to expand it in order to tackle exactly this, uh, this problem and add to the literature in this respect. So the main contributions and findings uh, from the paper are that the authors use uh, real transaction level data from the Russian payment system. And as a uh, as sort of a case study, they use the banking crisis in Russia in 2004, which disrupted 50% of interbank connections. So this is quite a severe stress on the system. And I think uh, while maybe the crisis was unfortunate in itself, uh, it, it also presents a nice case study for exploring such stress further. So the authors uh, develop uh, an equilibrium model of customer and supplier firms in which these disruptions propagate and affect firm growth. Uh, part of this is also assessing a given firm's resilience and also studying this, uh, this, this aspect as well. What they showed both theoretically and empirically using the model and also the data from the uh, from the banking crisis in the Russian payment system uh, is that illiquidity spillover effects can occur through two main channels. Loss of payment access is a, a very uh, direct uh, shock and then shop out amplification through propagation of this stress. So this sort of more indirect uh, approach. Uh, payment shocks uh, can have persistent deleterious effects on firms revenue growth and are more severe, the more central a firm is in the payment network uh, and also the more sensitive its centrality is to the payment network. So this was quite interesting because uh, one of the things discussed in the paper uh, was that even though a shock in the payment system can be transitory, can last for a very short period of time, uh, the effect on the firm's growth can actually last quite a long time and they discuss even months uh, months in the future and even, even longer. So some points for consideration. I, I won't talk about the uh, you know, the, the, the model itself and the approach, I think uh, models are models, nobody expects them to be perfect. So I think maybe we can focus on what we can do with the model and, and even how uh, we can leverage it in the future and improve it and think about 
adding further components to it. So uh, the first point uh, is related to the fact that the model captures a network of customer and supplier firms in this kind of multi-firm production economy. Uh, and then they allow payment shocks to propagate and, and study this propagation. So one thing that we could think about is how far downstream these payment system disruptions can, can reach. This is a bit of a silly point, but uh, could they even reach down to, to uh, household levels? I, I, I mean, such a vast model would, I, I think, be quite, uh, quite difficult to do. But what other extensions and further considerations of the model can improve the fruitfulness of results? One thing that always comes up in a time of crisis is central bank intervention. So perhaps uh, approach like this, a simulation approach, could also be used to study appropriate ways for central banks to intervene during times of, of banking crisis, and this could possibly be incorporated into some model into, into the thinking. Uh, then the effects from payment system disruptions depend on payment network centrality, according to the paper, and also sensitivity of this eigenvector centrality. Um, so what, what does this mean for policymakers? Should regulators pay greater attention to a given firm's position in the payment network? Of course, uh, if uh, if a given firm is is has a high eigenvector centrality or centrality in the network, this undoubtedly means that for major jurisdictions, these are probably part of the GSIP banking groups. Uh, and if they're part of smaller jurisdictions, then these banks are certainly systemic uh, in those in those areas. Uh, uh, but uh, in case that's that's not the case and we're discussing firms that are very sensitive in their eigenvector centrality, then maybe this is something to look at in terms of their position in this network and how they can also contribute to propagating stress. So um, I will now move on to quite a different uh, paper, and that's assessing the safety of central counterparties. The background here is that uh, regulatory reforms uh, in 2008, 2009, as a result of some G20 leader commitments, uh, put in place after the global financial crisis have caused CCPs to become large, central, and critical nodes in the global financial network. Uh, now, this has brought benefits and, and downsides as well. The benefits include increased transparency. We've moved from an opaque bilateral world where transactions were negotiated bilaterally between firms to a place where now things are centralized and the risk is managed by a single entity, the, in this case, the CCP for the clearing and settlement, uh, the, for the clearing of derivatives and, and also securities. Product standardization uh, leading to more markets. Uh, and uh, probably a big one is netting benefits for market participants. So now uh, it's not only about netting between bilateral trades, but since now your counterparty is the central counterparty, you can net across all of your trades with all of your counterparties that are also have the central counterparty as, as kind of the, the intermediary there. Uh, but this comes at a big cost. Uh, you've now created single points of failure. You've now created these very large, very central, and very critical nodes in the global financial system. So uh, CCP systemic nature uh, really highlights the importance of properly assessing their ability to cope with financial stress. Because they're so central in the network, because banks, large banks typically have their largest exposure to CCPs as a result of this, uh, it's really important to ensure that the risk management framework of CCPs is appropriate and can deal with financial stress. Uh, so again, this is directly related to CCPs uh, risk management frameworks, and it has consequences for possible contagion effects in the case of a, of a CCP default. Uh, the COVID crisis has put uh, real emphasis on CCP margin practices, as, as well as on recovery and resolution. Uh, I've put some links down here in my slide on some ongoing international work uh, you might be interested to read the holistic review of the March market turmoil published by the FSB last year. Uh, from that, some work has launched on reviewing margin practices. Uh, you can read a, a, a CPMI press release discussing that surveys were sent out to various market participants uh, to really understand what, what happened on a more granular level. Um, and uh, so this, this work is also, is also ongoing. The author's contributions are that they use publicly available data, mostly publicly available data, uh, to assess CCP risk levels using three uh, metrics based on the probabilities of IM breach, guarantee fund breach, and CCP default. Uh, so the first two use the publicly available data, and then the CCP default, as Mark uh, stated, comes from more confidential data from these uh, CCAR assessments. So uh, essentially what happens is that daily CCPs call for variation margin, and this reflects uh, the movement of a, of a given uh, clearing member's or client's portfolio as the market moves. So 
repo as markets move against or in their favor, uh, then there are these margin calls. In the case that the margin calls cannot be met, that the clearing members and clients cannot come up with the liquidity to pay them, uh, they are declared in default. And now these resources are now tapped into to ensure that there's enough liquidity so that the CCP can stay solvent. Uh, the first tranche uh, is uh, the so-called the IM, these pre-position collateral uh, that was put in place uh, uh, at the beginning of the day uh, based on model predictions of potential future exposure of portfolios uh, held by the market participant. So um, the second major thing is the fact that the authors proposed this new metric for thinking about the resilience of the CCP. And that's a uh, something that they call the CCP stress index. And this is similar in spirit to the LCR for banks. Uh, and this really assesses the guarantee fund's ability to meet obligations in case of a member default. So uh, one thing that they propose is that the indicator could be used to calibrate CCP guarantee funds. Uh, as Mark stated, there's, there's really no standard for doing this, whereas for IAM, there are very, um, th there's international guidance on how the model should work uh, in order to think about calculating potential future exposures for portfolios. The authors find that heterogeneity in computed metrics across CCP size and jurisdiction and substantial breach increases in Q1 of 2020 due to the COVID-induced market stress. So what I want to highlight here is uh, the fact that the authors use publicly available data, and I think this is wonderful, uh, and also the fact that now the data is becoming of good quality uh, enough to actually be doing something useful with it. Uh, what I will say about this is that we are somewhat lucky that the turmoil happened in March of 2020 and not in January, for example, and that is because of the quarterly release of this data. Uh, in, in looking at granular data on, from the crisis myself, I know that uh, VM, uh, the, the kind of VM um, stress went down quite quickly after the crisis. I am slowly coming down to pre-crisis normal levels, but if the if the reports uh, were essentially released in January, then the March data would really only uh, affect kind of the tail end of what we saw from the crisis. And really this data would not have been terribly useful to assess what happened during the crisis. So it, like I said, in some ways we're, we're, we're quite lucky in that respect, but it also makes us think about what improvements or changes could be made to the publicly available data to further increase its usefulness. And, and uh, Mark talks about some of this in the, in the paper. Uh, now, to take a step beyond this, I think it's important to think about important pieces of the puzzle that are often missing in discussions of CCP resilience. So uh, one thing that's often done is thinking about individual CCP's uh, risk management frameworks um, without really thinking about the other side of it, meaning the market participant's ability to meet liquidity demands, so the so-called liquidity supply issue. So my question here is how can we properly assess CCP riskiness without the explicit consideration of the capacity of clearing members and their clients to source liquidity to meet margin calls. And even if clearing members are included in consideration, clients are important here as well because they constitute the vast majority of market participants that actually employ CCP services. Clearing members in major jurisdictions number in the hundreds, clients number in the, in the thousands, sometimes tens of thousands. So uh, these are entities that really rely on very small number of large intermediaries, typically large dealer banks, uh, in order to access CCP services. And their ability to meet margin calls can have an effect on clearing members' ability to meet margin calls, which can then affect the solvency of CCPs. So I think this is an important point uh, going forward. Uh, finally, does the highly interconnected nature of the network of CCPs, clearing members and clients, require us to take a more macro look at the risk posed by these infrastructures and not simply tweaking the risk management frameworks of individual CCPs? What I, what I sort of mean by this is that often focus is put on how an individual CCP will uh, put pre-funded resources in place, how it calculates its initial margin, uh, and its particular resilience. But because clearing members, especially large clearing members, uh, are often participating in a number of CCPs, um, this really tells you how interconnected the entire system is. And so a CCP default should not be seen in isolation because one CCP default could also trigger other CCP defaults, which was triggered in the first place by some large client or clearing member default in the first place. Uh, so I think taking a more macro look at this uh, makes a lot of sense. There is some effort in some jurisdictions uh, to do this. 
Um, uh, and in addition, uh, in addition, taking into account also the liquidity preparedness of market participants to meet these calls is an important component here. So not only the system of CCPs themselves, uh, but also the ability of market participants to meet uh, increased demands. So from that, I will I will stop and hopefully I didn't go too far uh, over time. Uh, thank you very much, Mati, and for the speakers for the opportunity to discuss the papers. Okay, thank you very much, Algiris, uh, for the comments, indeed, uh, and uh, for good uh, Good questions there. I'm trying to look if we have any any questions on the channel, which seems to be mute and silent, uh, apart from my testing and some reply. Um, so we are kind of uh, well uh, well able to cope this this uh, huge wave of questions questions coming from the chat uh, with the available time. Which is not much left uh, before the uh, planned uh, break. Now, um, I wonder if the, the questions, uh, Argiris, you presented uh, were interesting. Uh, still, if you allow, I will consider them being rhetoric and uh, I will um, not give the floor back now to the, to the speakers because we are a bit over time on the planned session. So we would go to the break now and uh, it was planned to be 15 minutes but uh, if I'm right we have uh, about 11 minutes left of that. So we will have now a break of 11 minutes and we will continue with the session 4 exactly as planned in the agenda. Um, And there's one question uh, raised in the chat, but uh, we can continue that in the chat uh, on the on the break. Uh, so we'll continue with the with the session uh, in uh, now 11 minutes uh, from now in the next session. But please uh, continue the discussion in the chat, and then in the end of the day, in the informal session, as as mentioned earlier. fintech and uh, distributed FMIs. Um, our first, so each each uh, presentation will be 15 minutes with eight minutes for discussion. There will be a little bit of time if uh, speakers are on time for questions. So feel free to uh, ask your questions in the chat. And uh, the first presenter will be uh, Ajit Desai from the Bank of Canada. And the discussion will be Michael Goffman from the University of Rochester. Ajit, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Martin. I just want to see if I change the slide, you can uh, see the, it's moving. It, yep, it's moving. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining, joining us. I would like to start by thanking organizers for this opportunity to present our paper in this important payment research conference. As title suggests in this paper, we use machine learning approach called reinforcement learning to estimate the policy function, in the, uh, policy function of the bank interacting in the high value payment system. This is joint work with Pablo Castro from Google, Handu and Francisco Rivadeniera from Bank of Canada, and Rod Garrett from UCSB. Note the usual disclaimer applies. The opinion here are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the ones of the Bank of Canada. So let's get started with the introduction. High value payment systems are used to settle transactions between large financial institutions and are part of the nation's core financial infrastructure. Worldwide, most of the high value payment systems are of type real time gross settlement or RTGS systems, where payments are settled in real time without netting. From the systemic risk perspective, the RTGS systems are safe uh, as transactions are settled uh, immediately without finality. Uh, with finality, however, they bring many challenges, such as for participants, a participating bank managing liquidity become much more uh, costly and expensive. And from the central bank perspective, ensuring the safety and efficiency of the system become important. In order to overcome such challenges, we set out to explore answer to the following questions. Can machine learning, which is an, which is an application of AI emerging uh, as a promising tool to solve complicated problem, help us to find a solution up to the liquidity management problem? And could this solution be a guide to financial institutions uh, and the central banks to overcome some of the challenges? 
So our objective in this paper is to approximate the policy rules of the bank interacting in the high value payment system. Specifically, we consider the problem of uh, learning the best response function of the bank uh, in order to understand model their behavior. And we think that understanding the behavior of the financial institution can assist us in two, two ways. The first is ensuring the safety and efficiency of the system, and it can also help us to design new payment system. However, to achieve these goals, it is important to study the complex strategic interaction among the payment participant. But given we have this enormous size of the payment network and complex strategic interaction of many participants and indivisibility uh, of the payment, it is hard to build a track trackable economic models in such cases. So we think that the flexible machine learning approaches such as reinforcement learning could be useful in these cases. Here, Ariel is a computational approach to automate learning from repeated interaction with the environment. It has few key, key strengths in this type of application compared to the other meta, methods which could be used here. Uh, for example, Ariel allows for learning strategic decision uh, as opposed to a pure simulation based approach where we uh, where we there is no learning happening. Also, Ariel allows broad specification of the learning environment such that the environment could be stochastic. It could have a large state space. It could have multiple agent. Uh, and Ariel can also learn from the partial observation uh, only, therefore doesn't require the transition probability beforehand, which could be the case for ABM models, uh, which, which demands a, a complete state representation and uh, transition, uh, transition probability in the model. Also, Ariel provides opportunity to couple with the deep learning, which allows for complex nonlinear functional representation in the form of neural network, and which can help us to solve the more complicated problems. So in this paper, at this point, we use the simple two, ag two agent RTJ system setup, which I will discuss later. However, this paper is a part of the agenda where we want to uh, step by step move closer to the more realistic system. In our environment, RL agent representing the banks interact in a simplified payment system to learn policy functions in order to reduce the cost of processing their payments. They do that by choosing two uh, key strategic decision how much am amount of initial liquidity to allocate and the rate at which they want to pay intraday payment as the demands arise from the client. We first try to learn these decisions separately and then simultaneously. We will, will, uh, we will, you will show, uh, I will show that later that simplifying the problem and separating the decision could help us to build a trust on these approaches before we can go and use them on the more complicated setting. The key takeaway or lessons from our uh, from results so far is over time, agent train uh, using reinforcement learning learn the optimal policy functions which minimize the cost of processing their individual payments. Such models are robust and could help us understand the sensitivity uh, of the policy function to uh, to the unobservable quantities such as the such as cost of delaying the payments, which is uh, unknown to the policymakers and the researchers. In the interest of time, I'm moving, uh, skipping all the literature and directly moving on to the reinforcement learning introduction. In general, RL setup have five key components as shown in the schematic, in which there are two key components, agents and environment. Here, single agent, uh, it is parameterized as a uh, parameterized learner interacting with the environment, which represents everything other than the agent in this virtual world. The state is a representation by a setup variable used to define, uh, define the state of the environment observed by the agent. Action is the choice made by the agent and reward or cost is the immediate cost of performing such actions. And the goal of the agent here is to maximize some social, uh, notion of the cumulative reward by learning from experience gathered by repeatedly interacting with the environment. In the context of payment system, an agent is a bank uh, or multiple blank, uh, banks in the, in the multi-agent setup, which are participating in, uh, in the payment system. And the environment could be a payment system simulator environment. The actions here, as you can see on the slide, could be initial liquidity allocation at the start of the day and intraday payment decision during the day. And the cost could be, for example, it could be cost of uh, allocating the initial liquidity or delaying some of the payments during the intraday or end of day borrowing cost. And the state transition to the new state due to the agent's current action could be some indication of the current time step, which could be a period which period agent is in, and the liquidity evolution as payment send and issue, uh, agent send and issue the payments. And there is the agent could decide delay, to delay some payments, so the transition of that and uh, there could be a new payment arrival in each of this period. In this setup, agent interact with the payment system environment to gather experience to learn and optimize the liquidity and intraday payment decision. Let's take a look how they do that. There are various algorithms to learn the policy function. Here we use the simplest algorithm called reinforce, which involves directly optimizing parameterized policy pi, uh, representing value function as shown here. 
to do that, what we need to uh, need is experience in the form of state, action, and reward, just we saw in the previous slide. Then using stochastic gradient descent, the policy parameter thetas are updated use, uh, using the equation uh, shown on the slide, where the gradient is obtained by taking expectation over state action transition, uh, transition multiplied by the reward. And the agent wants to find the optimal policy pi, which is obtained by simply uh, uh, argmax over the policy function. There are many other ways we can learn this policy function, but at, at this point, we use the simplest one. So let's take a look at the payment system environment. I believe this audience doesn't need much of the introduction, but to, to familiarize with our setup, we have this simple, simplified two agent setup where only two agents participating called bank A, bank B are schematically shown on the slide. Each bank has its own payment demand, most of which is generated through their client. Requesting some, uh, some of those payments might be related to their own activity. Uh, in order to exchange those payments, they need liquidity, which can be arranged in two way. They can uh, allocate some of the liquidity to the central bank to get some collateral, or they can uh, uh, and they can use the payments which they have received during the intraday. In our setting, we we also impose following condition: at end of each of this day, each bank has to satisfy all of their payment demand. If the bank does not have sufficient liquidity, they have to borrow from the central bank. So let's go through a typical day of how that works. At start of the day, that is period zero, each bank has a collateral denoted by B, and the bank wants to place a part of the collateral to the central bank in order to get the initial liquidity L0, and these, these things are associated with the cost call RC. The initial liquidity decision is X0, which is a discretized between zero and one, where zero means pledge nothing, and one means pledge everything. This is a strategic decision because uh, the timing of the arrival of incoming payment depends on how much initial liquidity other bank post. We divide each day into T intraday period, and each of this period agent receives the payment demand called PT. Also, in each of this period, the agent has to make a decision how much to send, in, uh, which is denoted by the XT, and which is also described between zero and one. Here, also, agent has a strategically make decision in order to, uh, uh, in some setting, and learn to send everything to avoid delay in other setting. At the end of each intraday, uh, each of the period, the agent receives the payments from other agent, which is generated by RT, and its liquidity was as shown on the equation. And there is a cost associated with the delayed payments in each of, each of this period, which is denoted by RD, uh, that, uh, that relate to the, the payment agent did not send, uh, able to send in that period. In the last period, each bank has to satisfy the payment demand for that day. If the bank does not have sufficient liquidity, it must borrow from the central bank at uh, some cost called RB. So for a given day, which we, we also uh, refer to as an episode in our reinforcement learning terminology, the total cost is some of the initial liquidity, per period delay cost, and the borrowing cost as shown in the equation on the slide. So let's take a, a look at the learning set, uh, setup uh, and uh, some of the cases. We do learning exercise in multiple setups. In each of these setup, objective of the agent is to minimize the total cost of processing the payment, which is some of the uh, liquidity, delay, and borrowing cost. Depending on the setup, the cost function could be slightly different. Sometimes you might only have to uh, have to worry about liquidity and borrowing, and sometimes all of these you have to take a trade off between all of these. So, and we take a step by step approach here. We we first train our agent with a separate action, uh, learning action that is in the initial liquidity and intraday payments actions are separated and independently learned. And then we go with uh, about learning them simultaneously. Then we perform joint action exercise where both actions are being learned simultaneously, but for now only one agent is learning. So in the second case, in this, in the first case, both of both actions are separate, but both agents are learning simultaneously. In the second case, for now we have both actions are learn, uh, being learned simultaneously, but only one of the agent is learning. Other agent is just following the intraday policy. And then we first, uh, then we introduce uh, this called lumpy payments in one of this period and see how agent uh, strategically changes decision uh, when faced with this kind of lumpy payments. Uh, we, we use the payments demand uh, observed from the uh, Canada's high value payment system. Uh, we aggregated the observed payment into uh, of those participants between uh, two participants uh, on hourly intervals. The data contains about 380 business days worth of payments. One remarkable note to make is the difference in average, uh, average cumulative payments demand for each of the banks, suggesting that agent A tends to receive more payments than agent B for this particular uh, setup. For joint exercise, at this point, we only test for three period with only dummy payment. Imagine that three period being morning, afternoon, and evening, evening periods in the payment system. We are yet to test our setup uh, with a lumpy payment on the real data. So let's take a look at the separate uh, learning actions. 
In this case, where we have uh, learning only initial liquidity, we want to check if agent confronted with the divisible set of payment learn to allocate enough liquidity to reduce the delay cost and borrowing cost. Our state here is to represent the represents the vector of payment uh, demands uh, in each of this period. Liquidity action is the space represented by um, a fraction available collateral, and we discretize our action space into those 20 actions, which is a, represented as X0. Uh, and in each of this intraday period, we fix the intraday decision as send as much as possible. We choose a configuration of relative cost of that imposes realistic relation between these parameters. That is, RC uh, cost of collateral is less than the delay cost, which is less than the borrowing cost. To observe robustness, we run our experiment 50 times independently, and that is true for all the results I'm showing today. Uh, so we can determine the stability of the solution in the form of confidence interval. We can observe that both agents learn to reduce the total cost of learning gradually as shown in the first plot that with the increasing number of days or episodes, the both agent learn to reduce the total cost. Note that there is that there is no analytical solution in this scenario uh, with the 12 period uh, case, uh, but we tested a simple two period scenario where we could able to find an analytical solution. We have that in the paper. However, we do a separate wolf post search in order to verify that three results are uh, uh, as expected. In the second case, we want to check if the agent provide enough. Uh, if we agent is provided with enough initial liquidity at and at no cost, can they learn to send all the payments without any delay? Because there is no incentive now to delay. And the, in this case, the state space is represented by the the current period, the liquidity evolution, the delayed payments in each of this period, and the new payment demand. And action space is a fraction of the payments uh, in each of those each of those period, uh, which is represented as the PT. So in this case, we we have enough liquidity at no cost, which means no need to borrow, no need of borrowing. Therefore, the the cost function is very much simpler in this case, and it is a per period delay cost. So if agent learns to send everything that is xt is one in each of this period, the cost can go to zero. And we can see here in our multiple of 50 independent exercise, both the agent quickly learn to do that and reduce the cost close to the zero, which is uh, shown by the red line, and start sending all of their payment, which is, a, this is a fraction of the payment. So they are sending 100% of their data payments in this case. So now the more interesting joint, joint learning exercise. So in this case, both, both decisions are being uh, learned simultaneously. That's, that's a joint action, but only one of the agent is learning. Therefore, problem setup is slightly different than what we saw in the previous cases, but most the other things remain the same. So we perform this exercise with only three periods with the dummy payments at this point, and only agent A, which is our learning agent in this setup, learns both actions. That is liquidity, uh, liquidity action and the intraday payment action, which is again discretized uh, between zero and one. So agent B is a non-strategic here. That is, it follows a fixed policy, policy, and it allocates enough liquidity to send all the payments in each of this period. So there is no learning happening there. We first test our setup with only divisible payments, where we expect that our uh, our learning agent A should learn to allocate enough liquidity to send everything, but uh, but learn to do that both initial liquidity and intraday simultaneously, which makes it more uh, more challenging for the agent to do do that because there is now liquidity delay trade off. We then introduce one lumpy payment in uh, in the second period, uh, which is large fraction of the total demand in that period. So having a lumpy payment in the second period generates incentive to delay the delay in the first period that leads to the additional trade-off. So on top of liquidity and delay trade-off, an agent have to worry about uh, delaying between period one and period two. So that is a small increase in the delay in period one can have a large uh, reduction in the delay in period two due to the uh, indivisibility of the payment. So here we expect agent A to learn uh, to conserve some liquidity in the first period by delaying some payments uh, to send lumpy period in the second. Ajit, it would be ideal if you can uh, wrap up in the next couple of minutes. Yeah, so these are the last two slides I have. So so some of the results with that exercise. So this is what we get, get with a joint exercise uh, with only one agent. So uh, these are some early results we have got just this week. Uh, so here we show the learning curves of the agent choices in each period, zero, one, and two. On the left, we have is uh, when agent is faced with a divisible payment, and on the right middle column we have is agent is faced with the uh, lumpy payment, which is only coming in the period two. So we we can see that learning is smoother in uh, in divisible case, and the agent learns to allocate a slightly lower liquidity compared to the lumpy payment, as we can see the comparison between these two plots, and the confidence interval with the lumpy payments are a little bit higher. In the period one, 
uh, agent takes the precautionary behavior and uh, on average learns to allocate, uh, learns to delay more uh, payments in the period one compared to the divisible payment so that it can uh, avoid delaying the lumpy payment in the period two. And, uh, uh, but in the second period, uh, agent learns to send everything in both these setups. Uh, in this period, there is no incentive to delay any payments and our RL agent learn to uh, RL agent learn to allocate enough liquidity and right choice of payments in period one to be able to send lumpy payment and divisible payment in this period two. So to conclude and should just give a uh, slight hint of future plan that we demonstrate the applicability of RL to estimate the basis response function in this real world strategic game. I would like to emphasize that although RL uh, comes with many advantages to solve such complicated problem, it is not so uh, straightforward to uh, straightforward to use it. So our experience with these tools taught us that we can throw, we cannot just throw the problem at this algorithm and expect them to give the solution, at least in their current form. Therefore, we need to craft our problem carefully. So we are following this three-phase approach. In the first phase, we just use a simple two agent with a separate learning uh, and divisible payments, and we developed our in-house setup for that. In the next phase, uh, we, we have this joint learning exercise, but we also incorporate this lumpy payment as a shock to the system. Uh, and that in that phase, we collab, uh, combine with our tools with the open AI gym environment and dopamine Arial. This help us to use the more sophisticated Arial algorithm. And currently we are in the phase two. And in the last phase, what we want to do is to extend this setup to the end agents. And we want to add more bells and whistles of the payment system. And we make it a want to form its a package and release it to the open source. So we believe that once this package is ready, it could provide opportunity to study the complex payment behavior to uh, to us and to the others uh, to solve very innovative problem and could help us to design safe and efficient payment system. Thank you and sorry for a few minutes over. All right, uh, wonderful, thank you. So the discussion is Michael Goffman. Uh, Michael, you should be, oh, you already took uh, control of the slides, so the floor is yours. Hi everyone, thank you so much for the opportunity to discuss this paper. Uh, my research interests are both in the area of large value payment systems and AI. So it was really exciting to read the paper that combines uh, both uh, these uh, areas. Uh, this paper develops a new methodology to estimate banks policy functions in a large value payment system. And they show that reinforcement learning, which is a type of machine learning, can successfully approximate analytical solutions for simple problems and also provide some promising results for more complex environments when you have uh, multiple periods and so on. And overall, I find it an interesting case study for the use of artificial intelligence in the large value payment system. And it does showcase the ability of AI to make financial decisions in the situations uh, where there is uncertainty, which is the, the bread and butter of what we do in economics and finance. So we should see more applications like that in the future. Um, just to fix an idea as a super simple illustrative example, what the AI problem like um, program is trying to solve. So let's say you have two banks and uh, bank A needs to send to B 10 billion at 8.01 AM and B needs to send to A also 10 billion at 8.02 AM. Both of them simultaneously need to decide how much collateral to allocate at eight o'clock. So the answer is that A needs to put $10 billion of collateral, but B does not need to put any collateral because it's going to reuse the collateral provided by bank A and send the payment back. So this free riding of, uh, on liquidity of the counterparty is an interesting feature of uh, large value payment systems. And that type of decisions that the artificial intelligence system should uh, understand in the environments where the timing of the payments, the size of the, pay, the, size of the payments is the, not known to it. So the economic trade-off that the AI should understand is that on the one side, if you allocate more collateral in the beginning of the day, you are paying higher costs. But on the other side, it allows you to send payments more promptly. And the, the paper successfully shows that the AI is able to understand this type of trade-off after some, some period of learning. So my co uh, now I will give some comments, but it's mostly like big picture questions that I think would be interesting going forward to explore. So the first comment relates to the large value transfer system in uh, Canada, which is the data generating uh, process that uh, the AI is using here in this paper. So what is interesting uh, that this system is a hybrid system where you can use both collateral and credit limits 
to send payments. And most of the payments are actually sent using the credit, meaning that it's trust between banks that allows them to reduce substantially the cost of the collateral. And uh, what I show in my paper with James and Sajad is that the transitions of using these trust-based uh, channels to send payments to collateral-based uh, channel can generate systemic risk because there is not enough collateral to observe all this additional increase in liquidity that is needed due to transition of the system to RTGS, uh, from DNS to RTGS. And these transi transitions can happen intraday. We div develop some high-frequency measures to sort of uh, understand these transitions and to kind of label red flags um, associated uh, with this type of transition. So my first question would be, whether it would be possible to train a reinforcement learning algorithm to try to identify when payments are going to be made in the future, when payments are going to be rejected or delayed, and when the system requires injection of liquidity by a central bank. The second comment is about how should we teach our AI system. So on the one side, we can use humans who are like experienced operators of these payment systems that kind of somehow figured out to solve these uh, Bellman equations and so on. But uh, our paper shows that humans are not perfect because we do observe rejected payments, we do observe delayed payments, something that you would not see if it was like all perfect. So the concern would be that if we train the system using some actions that humans are doing, that can potentially uh, create suboptimal decisions that AI is making. On the other side, we cannot uh, train it using the closed form solutions, as, as was mentioned, because the problem is the problems are quite sophisticated. So uh, it's also possible that humans will coordinate on the bad equilibrium, where there is some, uh, you know, high provision liquidity or low provision of equality equilibrium, and we coordinate on the bad one. We obviously don't want AI systems to coordinate on the bad equilibrium. So potentially, maybe the promise of AI is going to be to help us to coordinate on a good equilibrium by improving maybe some coordination issues that uh, we can have in this type of system. And uh, we need to have a good measures of success that actually AI is able to do what it's uh, supposed to do. We need also to think about whether we envision a system where AI is running the show and all the payments are run by AI, whether we want a hybrid system where we have both humans and artificial intelligence working at the same time. So those are all important questions that we need to think about once these AI systems become more powerful. Uh, the paper assumes that the provision of liquidity is sort of like a, a non-cooperative game where almost like zero-sum game. If I provide more liquidity, then the other bank provides less, and we try to minimize the cost. But what we see in the data, that actually it's not clear to me that it's always non-cooperative, or maybe it's sometimes cooperative. For example, we observe that during times of stress, large Canadian banks inject liquidity, acting like a lender of last resort in some sense, to save the system from the stress. Also, when you expect to receive a repayment of a loan from yesterday from a counterparty, you do want them to be able to send you the payments. It's not obvious that you know you 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 kind of don't care about how much liquidity they pro, they have because you want them to have this ability to send payments to you. In the same way that banks um, care about their clients to be able to send payments on time. They also care about their clients to be able to receive payments on time from their counterparties. So in that sense, maybe, maybe there is a more cooperation that can happen using AI. And the problem that we want to solve is how to allocate the aggregate collateral across banks and across time so that we can process all the payments on time and also minimize the amount of collateral used to process these payments. The last point is about model specification. So in order to solve this type of AI models, we need to simplify the environment. We need to restrict substantially the information set that is available. So if you would run like a horse race between a human and AI in this type of problems, it will not be a kind of plain, uh, plain field. They will not have the same conditions. So given that uh, it will take time until AI can face the real institutional settings that uh, humans have in real payment systems, the question is, 
what is the benefit of having uh, AI learning from misspecified model and from situations where it does not have all the information about the timing of the payment, it cannot call to another kind of con counterparty and discuss with them when they are going to send the payment or to ask them to send the payments earlier. So what are the benefits from this type of systems before we achieve this superhuman abilities of AI? So let me conclude. Overall, uh, it should be clear to everyone at this point that the AI revolution is real. It's not some buzz in the news. And reinforcement learning has been extremely successful across multiple domains. So it's really uh, great to see this type of techniques are applied in the large value payment systems. And it's a very promising research agenda. We should see a, a lot more research uh, uh, along this direction. Now, my bet that the best kind of application of AI in the LVTS kind of large value payment system setting would be to try to predict liquidity shortages in the system and to help regulators to inject liquidity on time to prevent the next financial crisis. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Uh, we may have one minute for questions if there are any. I see that there have been questions in the chat and they've already been answered. Um, and if there are no questions, uh, and since we're pretty close to time, I think we can move on to the next paper, which will be presented by uh, David Tesoro Lucas um, from the uh, Autonomous University of Barcelona, and the discussion will be Joanna Stevens from the Boston Fed. So, David, um, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for the to the committee for accepting our our paper. So yes, this is a joint work with Rafael Auer, who is a senior economist at the Bank for International Settlements, and therefore I must say that the views expressed here in this paper are those of the authors and do not represent those uh, from the Bank for International Settlements. Uh, let me start by saying that the rise of Bitcoin, Ether, and related cryptocurrencies with the market capitalization at times rivaling that of silver and uh, even the world's uh, major financial companies warrants a close examination to investors' motivations and also their level of sophistication. And a popular narrative of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies uh, usually is that they are uh, uncensorable digital assets in fixed supply and an alternative to fiat money and commercial banking. But in reality, they have ample limitations. Uh, and also that they are not completely decentralized as uh, people say that they are. Uh, in different senses, like mining, exchanges, and even custody. And this popular narrative started just from the very beginning, from this paper of Shatoshi Nakamoto, uh, because he, she, or they, because we don't know uh, who that person is, uh, he was saying, or she was saying that what is needed is an electronic payment system based on cryptographic proof instead of trust. So they were saying that we don't really need a middleman. We don't need an intermediary, an intermediary, sorry. And also other founders of, for instance, the second most important cryptocurrency, Vitalik Buterin, uh, also consider non-discrimination and non-censorship one of the key principles behind the design of Ethereum and its token, Ether. And this narrative was also really evidenced by a series of events like the Red Hill Revolt that you all probably know in the last uh, days uh, of January at the beginning of February. So what are we going to do in this paper? Just to, to, to summarize it a little bit, in this paper, we are going to investigate, we're going to research about the hypothesis that cryptocurrencies are set out of distrust in, fi in fiat currencies or regulated finance. And also we will analyze the socioeconomic drivers of knowledge about an investment into cryptocurrencies. And we especially will focus on the ownership condition and on knowledge and also holding over time. Which data are we going to use? We're going to use data from the Survey of Consumer Payment Choice provided by the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. And it's really nice that here in this presentation, I think that we have a lot of people who have been really working with, with this survey. And with this particular strategy are we going to use? We are going to apply just, uh, first of all, a very, very simple uh, empirical or econometric model, which is going to be the linear probability model. And also we will move to a negative binomial model. So let me just uh, summarize a little bit the, the results that we have in the paper, just in case I don't have time at the end of the, of the presentation. So first, we, we found that cryptocurrency investors show no differences in their level of security concerns with either cash or commercial banking services. 
Also, we found that crypto investors tend to be educated, young, and mainly male, and also that digital financial experience matters. By type of cryptocurrency, we found that the usage of Ripple and Ether are the most educated ones, while the, the usage of Litecoin are the least educated ones. And also we found other, other, other important findings that I will discuss at the end of the presentation if I have enough time. So our paper is really related to different strands of the literature. For instance, to the literature analyzing the profiles and behavior of crypto users. And here, I think that yesterday we have the presentation of Helmut Stitz, who is one of the, of the authors that I'm mentioning there. And also it's related to the literature that studies the sociality of financial markets with the importance of lack of trust in the stock market participation. And also we contribute to the gender, the financial gender gap literature. Let me point out here the last paper that you have there in the screen, which is the paper of Chen et al, 2021, which is a, another Bank for International pay, uh, Bank for International Settlements working paper in which they study the fintech gender gap. And their conclusion is pretty similar to the conclusion that we are going to, to have here in this paper. So, uh, apart from that, our paper is relevant to different perspectives. First, uh, to consumer protection, we were asking ourselves, does the industry or specific coins prey on the poor and uneducated? Also, it's relevant to, uh, for regulation. Is more action needed? It's relevant also to, to gauge the potential of crypto markets and how large this asset class could eventually become. And also to analyze what are the trends and what do they imply for future demand. And finally, last but not least, it's also important to think a little bit about the possible CBDC design and the hypothetical users of CBDC. Tomorrow, I think that we have a lot of sessions about CBDC, so it is going to be quite, quite related to, to that. So let me go just very, very quick with the data that we are using. We are using, as I mentioned before, uh, the, this survey of consumer payment choice provided by the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. Uh, it is a survey, it is a representative panel with substantial entry and exit, and we are going to focus on this paper in the last data available that we have at the point when we wrote the paper, which was the 2019 data, okay, uh, which includes information on knowledge and ownership for cryptocurrencies. What are going to be the main variables that we are going to take into account in the paper? First of all, we have four different variables, which are the ownership or knowledge of cryptocurrencies. Okay, uh, for instance, these two, uh, these variables will capture whether an individual owns or knows at least one of the following cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Ripple, Litecoin, Ether, Bitcoin Cash, Stellar, EOS, and others. Okay, and apart from that, we are also going to have another two different variables, which are the number of cryptocurrencies that a person owns or knows, okay? And uh, what are going to be our, our endogenous variables? Well, first, we have some indicators regarding the security and convenience of, of, the, of different payments, means of payments like cash, bank account number payments, and online banking payments. And also, we have a, a, a bunch of socioeconomic indicators like household income level, education, gender, marital status, age, and race. And apart from that, we will also control from some or using some digitalization indicators, like the usage of the bit card, usage of mobile app for payments, and the usage of PayPal. And the methodology, as I was telling you before, is going to be pretty, pretty straightforward. First, we will start with a linear probability model. I will not stop on that. And later on, we will move to a negative binomial, binomial model. Okay, which is a kind of, of count model. Also, for sure, we will use a logit model, but at the end, the results, as you will see, are not going to change. I will skip the, the, the initial results. Okay, here we have some, some tables. It is only a, a very, very simple regressions. And I will go to the important, to the important part. Here we have uh, the joint regression using all, all the variables that we are considering. Especially, uh, I will focus on column seven and eight. Okay, and I have here a, a summary of it. First, we found that uh, security concerns have no impact on cryptocurrency investments, also conditional on socio-demographics. And this is one of the main uh, results of the paper. We also found that uh, an increase of one age reduces the probability of owning a cryptocurrency by 0.1 percentage points. Okay, and this result is more or less in line with the literature regarding the, the, the relationship between age and risk aversion. Also, we found that being a man increases the probability by 2.2 percentage points of owning a cryptocurrency. 
and again it's also related to the to the literature uh, which has uh, been a study the the relationship between gender and, and research aversion okay and also we found that moving to a higher category of education to a higher level of education uh, increases the likelihood between 0 0.5 and 1 percentage points of owning one cryptocurrency. So just to summarize, uh, the crypto users in 2019 in the United States were mainly male, young and uh, educated people. Also, we do the same uh, with, uh, with uh, knowledge and the results are pretty similar with some differences. For instance, here, income plays a role, while uh, I think that uh, education plays a role as well, but age is the variable which here is not longer relevant. Okay, and apart from that, as I was telling you, we have uh, uh, some robustness checks. First, uh, here uh, we condition the results, we receive the sample, okay, and the results are completely the, the same ones. Also using the negative binomial results, we found more or less exactly the same results with a little differences. For instance, that uh, when we are considering the number of owned cryptocurrencies, education and income are not significant here. As uh, just uh, for the sake of time, let me tell you a little bit uh, about the robustness checks. Okay, first, we interchange different variables like retirement, state of age, uh, also for sure income and education are never included in the same regression. Also, we perform a logit model using, uh, of course, average marginal effects, and the results are completely similar. And something that we also did was trying to estimate a logit regression with rare events, especially in the case of ownership of cryptocurrencies, because at the end, the population who has been owning a cryptocurrency is very, very low. And doing that, doing this type of, of regression, which is controlling for rare events, the results do not change at all. And this is, uh, this is really nice uh, for, the, uh, for the paper. Apart from that, uh, uh, we also try to uh, present some, some statistics regarding the, the use of cryptocurrencies by type of cryptocurrency. And we found that the users of Ripple and Ether are the most educated ones and also are the richest ones in the sample. Okay, let me mention, because I haven't mentioned it, that in the, in the survey we have population weights, which is really nice to, to, to apply uh, to our regressions. And finally, we discussed a little bit about the trend and the possible outlook of the cryptocurrency sector. First, uh, as you can see there in figure four, we, we found that uh, there is an increase okay, in the ownership of cryptocurrencies uh, until 2018, since 2016, and a little bit uh, of decrease in 2019. I think that right now the 2020 survey has been released and we were checking a little bit the data that we have and we also are going to see a, a very important increase in the, in the ownership of cryptocurrencies in the US population. And also we see an increasing trend in the knowledge uh, of at least one cryptocurrency. Also, let me point out that here with the data that we have, we try to study a very, very raw measure okay, of holding. And we say that holding means uh, if a person has owned uh, one cryptocurrency in the previous year. Okay, and what is the likelihood that that person is an owner this year? So we restrict the sample to those individuals which are present in two consecutive surveys. Okay, this is important. And we estimate that and we find that around 50% of the, our crypto owners tend to hold their cryptocurrencies. Apart from that, we also have uh, some trends in the gender gap. For instance, we found this uh, very important uh, gender gap between male and, and women, which was uh, even which was uh, really really important in 2018 and a little bit lower in 2019. And here we also have to check the data from 2020 in order to see whether this gap has increased or decreased. And on the contrary, uh, regarding the knowledge of cryptocurrencies, we found the opposite that the the gap is shrinking over time. So just I think that more or less in according to the, to the time, I'm uh, a little bit fast probably, but I think it's more or less okay. So let me conclude the, the paper. Uh, first, we
we do not really find a support of the censorship uh, resistance or alternative to fears hypothesis, okay? And it means that the security concerns with cash and confidence in online banking are associated, uh, are not associated with the, with the ownership of cryptocurrency. However, regarding knowledge, we do find this. Okay, and also we, we have found that educated, young and, and male are the ones which usually tend to own cryptocurrencies in the United States. And also we found that both knowledge acquisition and investment decisions, uh, conditional uh, of knowledge uh, matter. And finally, just in the last minute, we also find a kind of, of holding, okay, and also that the individuals who invest in cryptocurrencies are digital natives. But also there are some limiting factors that uh, it, uh, cryptocurrencies uh, remain uh, like a male asset. And indeed, while knowledge gap is rank, ownership gap grew in the 2019 data that we, that we have. And also that the cryptocurrencies are more or less restricted to, to the young people. Okay, and apart from that, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I have to, to say that this paper was published as a Bank for International Paper working paper. Okay, it is a nine, uh, the number uh, 951, if I remember correctly. And please feel free to send me all your uh, questions that you have in order to, to improve it. Thank you so much for your attention. All right, thank you very much. So to discuss will be uh, Joanna Stevens. So Joanna, you should be able to take control of the slides. Um, uh, I just lost the take control button. I used to have it, so I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, the slides have disappeared. So I think somebody's going to have to reload the slides and then you'll be able to take control of them. And then again, I'll mention that uh, everyone should feel free to uh, put their questions into the chat. And, and so far, the um, uh, the paper's authors have been responding directly, which is great. Okay, so I think you have the slides now. Uh, that's oh. not my slides. Yeah, so you have to advance. Do I have to go forward? I believe so. Or maybe they're going to be able to uh, set the slides to your... Okay, you, you should be able to move forward. Yeah, 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 I'm scrolling. Sorry, there's a lot of slides here. Oh, all good. It's not moving on, on my screen yet, but I, it's probably just lagging. Yeah, I'm doing on the bottom of my screen, so. No, it reset itself. Hmm. Okay, okay, I see them, hold on. No, it keeps resetting, so I, I don't seem to... So somebody's, somebody's taking control away from me. <laughs> okay, so, so please, Yenny is taking control from here, so we can move it to the right place, and then we tell you when, okay. when you can. It's a bit going back and forth, uh, so please wait for a moment. Now it should be on the right slide, so now you can yeah, Joanna, yeah. take control and... Uh, continue from here. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much for inviting me to discuss this very interesting paper. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to summarize the paper since I only have a few minutes and it was very clearly and well presented. It's a very interesting topic and obviously a very timely topic. Uh, in particular, what I like about it is that most of the studies of consumer payments look either at aggregate demand or representative agent. So what was uh, interesting about this paper, in addition to the topic, is that they show differences across income, education, age, and gender. So I strongly believe that those are all important factors, and obviously the authors have uh, proven it, and there's previous literature that shows uh, some similar findings. So that's certainly important. Uh, they take advantage of detailed survey data, and they distinguish awareness from ownership, which is also a, a very interesting and important topic. So I'll mainly focus my comments on some details about the SCPC data, which I have worked with uh, for a number of years now. Uh, but one of the things that I think the paper could, or the authors could flesh out more uh, clearly and could point it out in the paper is why do people buy and hold cryptocurrency? 
So obviously there are uh, various reasons and they are sort of mentioned in the paper in various places, speculative asset, store of value or means of payment. And I think that uh, depending on the purpose, um, different types of analysis might be relevant here. So for example, if people's attitude towards cash and online, online payments matter, and the authors include in their analysis, so that would, be, uh, excuse me, that would imply that people hold cryptocurrencies for payments. But if they buy cryptocurrencies as speculative investment or even store of value, then maybe their attitude towards payments is not quite relevant. Um, so they do obviously use the term invested, and I think the title has a term invested. So I think that that implies um, that cryptocurrencies are used as an asset. So I would just uh, encourage them to make a more clear distinction. And I think the survey can be useful here because the SCPC asks for a primary reason to own uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, so one thing sort of as a background, I guess, to put things in perspective is that cryptocurrencies uh, holding is still very rare. So looking at the SCPC survey data conducted over the years, um, including even the 2020, which is the more recent survey that wasn't available when the authors were working on their paper, uh, you can see that only a tiny fraction of respondents own cryptocurrency. And in particular, the year uh, that the authors use for their analysis uh, over 3,000 respondents and only 35 people had cryptocurrency. So I think it's important to keep it in perspective that it's still a very unusual thing to have. Um, and SCPC also asked the respondents, what's the reason for owning cryptocurrency? Actually, in earlier versions of the survey, they referred to it as virtual currency. But in any case, trust is not a big reason. So the authors are interested in you know, the, whether trust is a, is a reason why people own it. And it's, the survey results indicate that only a tiny fraction of respondents say they do not trust banks. Uh, the, by far the most important reason and, and growing over time is for investment. So indeed, people seem to buy cryptocurrency as a speculative asset. Uh, and it's not really used as a means of payment either, because uh, very few people uh, chose a response to buy goods or, or services or to make payments anonymously. So it is mainly seems to be purchased for investment purposes. Another thing I wanted to point out is that awareness and knowledge are not the same thing. Um, and the authors seem to use it interchangeably in the paper. Uh, I think that a lot of people might be aware of cryptocurrency or probably more often aware of Bitcoin specifically, because it's a name that shows up in the media and newspapers all the time, but they don't really understand it. So for example, at least one SCPC survey, owners of virtual currency, as it was referred to at the time, were asked what kind they have, and they were allowed to write in their answer. And some of them said PayPal or euros. So clearly they're not exactly knowledgeable about what cryptocurrency is. Um, and then respondents uh, who said that they're aware of Bitcoin were asked, how familiar are you with how Bitcoin works? And you can see that more than half, about 60% of people uh, repeatedly say they're not at all familiar. So I think the level of knowledge and understanding is not really there yet. So when the authors say that knowledge about cryptocurrencies is already pervasive, I think that's a very optimistic statement and I would probably dispute that and, and say that uh, there is really, the extent of understanding is not really sufficient to make educated investment decisions. Um, so I'm not saying that people shouldn't be buying Bitcoin, I'm just saying that we can't assume that they really understand it. Um, and there are potentially network effects, so more information would probably be helpful, uh, add more education, uh, that will probably generate some interest and maybe more merchant acceptance. So to whatever extent uh, cryptocurrency can be used for, for payments or purchasing, um, that could only help. So knowledge could be helpful here. And I also wanted to point out that we have in the past administered a special survey that the SCPC vendor could conduct. So if you're really interested in, in uh, getting some details on the extent of knowledge and understanding, you could uh, administer a special survey to the respondents of the SCPC um, and get some more details about it. Um, and other things I wanted to talk about is measuring security and convenience. So the authors uh, say that they measure uh, security and convenience of traditional banking and online banking, uh, but they really, what they look at is two different payment methods. And the payment methods, although there is a difference between them, they're really very similar. So they're both electronic payments out of a bank account using ACH. Uh, one is called bank account number payment, the other one is online banking bill payment. 
Um, and the, met the methodology or technology behind is slightly different, but they both use ACA. So there's really not much difference between them. So I wouldn't necessarily refer to it as attitude towards traditional banking. It's more the specific payment instrument that uh, the CPC measures rating of. And also the ratings um, are, although they are numerical and the authors look at the ratings of convenience and security, I would uh, suggest that maybe you would consider using relative ratings instead of absolute ratings because these are subjective measures. Uh, so for example, we found in the past that some people tend to be more sort of optimistic or more positive in their assessments than others. So one way to go around it is to look at uh, relative um, ratings. So for example, how consumer I rates payment method J relative to all other payment methods. So for example, how do I rate security of cash relative to security of all other payment instruments? And that way, even if I'm natural born optimist, uh, I would still pick up the differences across payment instruments. So that's just one thing to consider. Uh, in terms of methodology, I would just say that uh, survey weights, um, my main, I guess, comment about methodology is that survey weights in that SCPC are constructed based on demographic variables to generate sample that resembles the US population, the census. So when you include demographics in the regressions, I'm not sure why weights are also included. And when you look at the regression tables in the paper, every single table says weights are included. So I'm not sure if this is really true and if this is necessarily correct. So I would um, encourage the authors to, to think about it a little more. Uh, I mean, we've used uh, weights for sort of descriptive tables and summary tables, but not necessarily for regressions. Also, maybe for age, you might want to try nonlinear specification like age square, because it is possible that the, the knowledge and ownership of cryptocurrency declines with age, but maybe it's not a linear effect. Um, some specification, you restrict the sample to people who know about cryptocurrency, but the sample size in, in the tables is all the same. So I wonder if that's a typo. Um, and finally, the gender comment, I find it extremely interesting that women are more risk averse for fintech and cryptocurrency, and that certainly has been shown before. But men use significantly more cash. I found in my studies and other people have, even after controlling for other attributes. And in fact, the gap between men and women increased during COVID because women really decreased their use of cash more than men. Um, and then finally, conclusions are about regulation of cryptocurrency. It seems to me that uh, it's not really tied to the meat of the paper. So I would suggest either adding something more about regulation in the paper or maybe make conclusions a little more uh, relevant to maybe knowledge or information dissemination and network effects. Thank you very much. So I'm right. not supposed to hit anything, right? Yeah, I believe um, uh, the next uh, presenter will take control. And so um, I, I see that there's a bunch of questions that have been answered in the chat. So that's awesome. And I encourage people to continue to use the chat. Um, and, and since we are pretty much right on time, we'll move on to the last paper, uh, which will be uh, presented by uh, Ye Lee from uh, Ohio State University. And the discussant will be Pablo Azar from the New York Fed. Uh, and so the floor is yours. Right, so first I want to thank the organizers for including this paper uh, into the program. Uh, I work uh, on both fintech uh, macrofinance, but also uh, the, the uh, payment system related issues. I personally feel I really benefit a lot from the previous presentations. Um, so in this paper, what we try to do uh, is first and foremost to design a model uh, that can be uh, uh, realistic enough to talk about uh, uh, issues that practitioners and policymakers uh, about regarding the stable coins. So why do we care about stable coins? So right now in the uh, cryptocurrency space or in general, the blockchain space, uh, there is kind of a, a movement uh, about uh, decentralized finance. So what is decentralized finance? Basically, people try to uh, build blockchain-based alternatives to banking, brokerage, exchanges, a whole financial system built on blockchain. And uh, the, the rationale is that uh, this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, system will uh, reduce the intermediation cost. And also there are incentives to avoid the regulations, to avoid the taxes, et cetera. But the, the growth of DeFi is really rapid. 
And a key part of DeFi is actually safe asset creation. We know that in the traditional finance system, safe asset is very important, especially when it comes to the function as means of payment. Because when I pay you something, you do not want to uh, want the, the value of the payment to fluctuate fluctuate a lot during the settlement period, right? And also, when I pay you something, you want the payment, the settlement asset. Uh, to be information insensitive so that there's no adverse selection issues, no lemon problems. We don't need to worry about whether I have more information than you regarding the value of the asset. So we want safe asset. We want information insensitive asset as means of payment, but also as a safe asset when it comes to portfolio rebalancing, especially for those crypto traders who do not want to uh, transfer money out of the blockchain system and into the real world system because then they need to pay capital gain tax. Uh, well, so there are many stable coin suppliers. There are specialized suppliers, but also we see this traditional uh, finance uh, corporations like JP Morgan, they start to introduce their, their own stable coin or at least uh, uh, started uh, to do R&D on these issues. Uh, and also we see uh, leading digital platforms like Facebook try to introduce stable coin. So in this paper, uh, okay, so here just a simple graph that shows you the rising of cryptocurrency lending, the borrowing and lending of cryptocurrency, and also decentralized exchange. Uh, it really, really correlate with the rise of stable coins in the last few years. Uh, so if you just look at the numbers, right, basically we have roughly $100 billion worth of DeFi at this moment. And then we have, uh, well, here I just to select the major stable coins, but if you count them all, right, almost $100 billion worth of uh, stable coins. So uh, it's still small, uh, but it's rapidly growing. Uh, it's growing so fast that uh, both at the, uh, uh, United States Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve, people start to talk about regulations. And uh, recently there is an uh, uh, initiative taken by some congressmen, congresswomen, uh, try to regulate uh, the issuers of stablecoin, making sure that stablecoins are over collateralized. So we want to write a paper about all these issues. But first, of, first and foremost, we want to write a model that rationalizes all the strategies observed in practice, like open market operations, that is the dynamic management of reserve assets uh, versus the issues and uh, the, the supply uh, uh, contraction expansion you know, of the stablecoin itself. And also the requirement of stablecoin users collateral, uh, transaction fee subsidies, repegging. You know, we know that when we talk about exchange rates, emerging markets especially, occasionally there will be some repegging. Uh, if there's some dollarization going on, maybe you peg to the dollar one to one, and then after a certain period of debasement, you repack it to one to 0.5 dollars, something like this. And also the issues of secondary units, or many people call it the governance tokens. Basically, these are the equity shares of the stable coin issuer balance sheet. I'm going to give you a graphic illustration later. So from a theoretical perspective, we want to characterize a form of agoric instability. So what do I mean here? So basically, you will have uh, you have you will have, have a bimodal distribution of states okay so the stable coin can stay stable for a very long time but after a sequence of negative shocks it can move to the in unstable region and it gets stuck there and the debasement can happen and the recovery can be very very slow so if you calibrate our model to some uh, leading stable coin platforms which we are trying to do at this moment, but we haven't done it yet. We're actually engaging in active uh, uh, conversations with some practitioners, try to operationalize our model and make it useful. But so the useful part of our model for practitioners, not only, you know, what is the optimal implementation of all these strategies, right? In the first body point, but also how to predict the debasement and the recovery of a stable coin. Of course, in this paper, uh, I may not have enough time to talk about all this, but we talk about the optimal regulation and we talk about the incentives behind uh, all these large platforms initiatives to introduce stable coin, especially Facebook. Um, so uh, last but not least, uh, we uh, we also talk about um, we we focus on the over collateralized stable coins. We do not look at the under collateralized stable coins because we think this is going to be the norm in the future, both from a regulatory perspective and also based on the white papers that you know that's what the stable coin issuers claim, right? I mean, what is the reality? Do they really? over collateralize their stable coins we don't really know and we know that the auditing practice in this space is uh, is very much uh, suboptimal uh, but uh, uh, but but you know this is how what we focus on and even with the over collateralization you still see debasement and that is a key point 
All right, so uh, we think of the creation of stablecoin really, really as a form of uh, crypto shadow banking that is unregulated safety transformation. You want to create a safe asset outside of uh, the regulatory framework. So I think there's some problem with the color here, but uh, uh, basically in panel A, we have some negative shock to the reserve asset, and then you have a loss, the equity share, which is the governance, governance token, will take, take the loss so that the stable coin can stay stable, right? But if the, if you, you, if the system gets hit by consist, consecutive negative shocks to the reserves, then we may have the debasement of the stable coin. Uh, but there is a more sophisticated system. So basically the governance tokens corresponds to the reserve value. But on top of that, you have the use stable coin users posting collateral to back their stable coins. And the, the user's equity share is the margin requirement. And if there is a shock that is so large, right? So large to the collateral, which can be Ethereum, Bitcoin, any cryptocurrency, it doesn't have to be dollar denominated assets. But if the shock to this collateral asset is so large, then you can see the margin wiped out, and then that's when the stablecoin issuers' reserves can actually come in, and of course the holders of Garden's tokens they will take a hit. So if you just look at these graphs, right, it looks very much like shadow banking, and I'm going to draw the analogy closer at the conclusion. But stablecoin has its uniqueness because of the debasement mechanism. All right, so uh, I'm going to go fairly quickly through the model because I'm already halfway into my time, I think. Uh, so we, we basically model the following things. The stablecoin issuer manages reserves that earns a return R, but also load down uh, some shocks that is a browning shock because we're writing continuous time. Uh, so the shock will be proportional to the outstanding value of stablecoin that is equal, uh, that is denoted by NT. Okay, of course, you can break down into the unit price PT and the token units ST. So the second term uh, on the right-hand side here, it basically captures open market operation, the dynamic adjustment of the supply. And uh, the platform may charge a fee in case this small FT is positive or subsidize the users. In this case, the FT is negative. So eventually, you operate a stablecoin issuer, uh, you want to make profits, right? So we allow the stablecoin issuer to extract profits in the form of dividends. On, and of course, this will be paid to the equity holders, that is the holders of governance tokens. So in equilibrium, uh, the token price will follow a diffusion process that we are going to solve indulgently, both the drift and diffusion. Uh, and then uh, what about the users, stablecoin user? What do they care about? Okay, so the last term here is actually very standard. It's just the access return. So the first, uh, the first three terms here, well, the first term represents some convenience yield in making payment. And you can see that the aggregate value of stablecoin NT goes into individuals uh, convenience yield, which reflects some network externality. Basically, when other people use this stablecoin as means of payment, well, it's better for me too. This sort of speak to the uh, the means of payment function. You know, when more people accept stablecoins, then the chance for me to use it as means of payment uh, is higher. All right. So A here is just a, a parameter that capture the quality of the platform. You can adjust it higher and lower to do some comparative statics. So the users need to pay the fee in case fee is negative, the subsidy, but uh, the key point here is the third term, right? So the user is averse, is averse to the information sensitivity of this stable coin, which is of course, by definition, the loading on the shock. Uh, so this is the preference for safety. All right, so we are going to characterize a Markovian equilibrium where the state variable is going to be the excess reserve, the reserve MT minus the value of outstanding tokens. And in a Markovian system, of course, the value function, the uh, token price or the stablecoin price, they are all functions of this one single state variable. And here we use the value function of the stablecoin issuer to define a relative risk aversion term. And, and this will come uh, very important when we discuss the, the debasement. So let me skip the, the graphs of the uh, value function. You can think about this as a valuation model of governance token, which nobody has done before us. We think that is kind of a pr uh, practical use. Uh, and then here, uh, let's look at the uh, exchange rate regimes. So basically, when the effective risk conversion of the issuers uh, are very high, uh, we can see that uh, the uh, the debasement happens. So basically, the, uh, the stable coins start to load on the shocks to the reserve asset. Well, you may ask me why, why the reserve asset is risky in the first place, right? So based on our understanding of the current stablecoin issuers, they do hold risky assets. For instance, the largest one, Tether, right? It holds commercial papers uh, of <coughs> known issuers, 
We don't even know who issued these commercial papers. It could be some real estate firm in China. So the reserve assets are risky, but it's not necessary that the stable coin price load on it. It can be stable as long as the platform in panel B here has enough excess reserve. But when the reserve dwindles, then that's when the platform become increasingly risk averse because once the reserve, uh, excess reserve falls to zero, that's when we say, well, the platform has to liquidate because you cannot, uh, you cannot meet the liabilities of your stable coins. So as the platform we move from right to left, right, uh, exhaust its reserves, that's when the debasement happens, that's when the stable coin price start to load on the shocks. Uh, and we can also plot here panel A, that's the uh, total outstanding value of stable coin. And if you are willing to assume a constant money velocity, you can also interpret it as the transaction volume. Of course, when there are more excess reserves, then that's when the transaction volume is higher. And then when there are less, then the transaction volume is, is lower. Uh, the transaction fee here, of course, when there are more excess reserves, that's when the stable coin issuer's financial flexibility or financial slack is very high. That's when the issuer actually willing to set the fees negative, encourage users to adopt the stable coin, especially from the perspective of network externality. But when the stable coin issuer runs out of reserves, that is when uh, it wants to really tax the users, try to rebuild the reserves, right? Try to recapitalize, gain some revenue sources. And then that's when we see the fee spikes up. And this we think are all in line with what we uh, observe uh, empirically. Uh, you can do some simulations. Uh, some paths actually looks, uh, you know, we think realistic, but again, we haven't done careful work in terms of the calibration. Uh, so what is key is that by model distribution, I already talked about it, right? In the low reserve states, the first bullet point here, there's a debasement of the stable coin. Remember the users, they don't like debasement. They don't like the information sensitivity. They don't like the loading on the shock. So the token demand or stable coin demand decline. This means less revenues for the platform. This means slow rebuild of the reserves. This means the debasement can persist for a long time. And then you can see in the, uh, sorry, in the second bullet point, this should be the high reserve state. That's when the token price is stable. There's demand for tokens strong. And then that's when the uh, a stable coin issuer can gain revenues, uh, maintain high reserves. And so the stability can also sustain for a long time. So this bimodal distribution is what I call the agoric instability at the beginning, is something that we find very interesting because you do not get this very often. You see this in Bruno Marisanikov, which is a macro finance model. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Ramshaw Roshi has a, has a model on banking, but with some regulation, then you get this bimodal distribution. And this arise, uh, arises naturally in the stable coin space. All right, so I'm going to skip the issues of governance tokens. Uh, we have some practical implications. So we also talk about the optimal uh, regulation. I think I'm short on time. I'm also going to skip, skip that. But keep in mind, you can optimize the capital requirement, basically the lowest uh, uh, threshold the excess reserve has to meet. And of course, if you set the capital requirement uh, tighter, uh, this will hurt the stable coin issuers. This will benefit the users, but you can you know, do some uh, uh, transfer payment. The users can pay some membership fee to the to the uh, to the stablecoin issuer or the platform, so that uh, you know you can achieve some Pareto improvement. All right. Uh, it is never optimal to actually regulate stablecoin as deposits. Perfect stability is not optimal because the platform can get into a place where its effective risk aversion is much higher than the users of aversion to token vol uh, volatility. So some level of risk sharing actually benefits. The whole system. Uh, of course, we uh, extend our model. You, the basement model is just from this panel A simple structure. We extend it to panel B, the more complicated structure. Again, my apologies for this, uh, uh, you know, not displaying properly the the, the uh, graphics. Uh, we, we solve the optimal margin requirement on users, which I think is also of some practical implications for the practitioners. Uh, all right. So, what about the incentive of the uh, large platforms to issue stable coins to take advantage of network effect. All right. So I'm not going to dive into the details of the graphs, but one point we we uh, we find very surprising is that as as you increase the network effect parameter, okay, as you do the comparative statics, what you do not find is that the platforms they will gain an increasing share of total welfare. Actually, the user's share of welfare is quite stable as the network effect increases. Uh, this is because the platform need to kind of cater to the users, 
you know, to pander the users because there's network externality. Okay, the stronger the network is net externality, the more uh, rent the platform can extract. But at the same time, the more worried about uh, the, the platform is about the users' lack of adoption because individual users they never internalize their own adoption of a stable coin or others. All right, so the uh, the issuer actually are willing to give out some surpluses. So it turns out that it's actually a very stable uh, prediction uh, across different parameters in our model. The user's share of welfare is very stable across different levels of network effect. So we also so you, to, if, yes, you could, if you could wrap up in a minute, that would be awesome. Yes. So we also uh, expand, sorry, sorry. We also ex expand the model to incorporate the data as a productive asset. Why? Because we think a lot of this uh, large platform there incentive to introduce stable coin is to build a payment system is to collect data like facebook right like like jp morgan's uh, new pay, uh, new 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 st uh, stable coin initiatives so we also do that and we find a, a kind of um, a dilemma between data acquisition and maintaining the stable coin stable so I, I don't have time to explain the mechanism but i hope you are interested enough to read the paper all right so let me just uh, conclude uh, so we we can draw an analogy between stablecoin and shadow banking. Okay, you can think about uh, the stablecoin issuers reserve management as a last line of defense here, uh, similar to banks in place of the guarantee to the SPV. And you can think about the stablecoin's issuers requirement of users to hold collateral as some uh, collateral haircut at SP, SPV when it raises money from the money markets. Uh, so what is unique about this stablecoin space is that we have a much richer set of strategies and we have the debasement that caused a bimodal distribution of the states, uh, a gordic instability. And what we want to do, you know, to shed light on the regulation and the incentives of the large platforms. Uh, thanks so much for uh, including the paper and I look forward to Pablo's discussion. Thank you very much. So Pablo, you should be able to take control of the slides and the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thanks, Yi, for um, a very interesting paper. Thanks, you and Simon. Um, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to discuss this paper. Um, I work at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and therefore there's a mandatory disclosure that the views reflected in this discussion are my own and not those of the Federal Reserve System or the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. So, uh, very interesting paper. It's very thorough and it touches on an aspect of stablecoins, in particular over collateralized stablecoins, that is not very well researched in the previous literature. And the main contribution of this paper is this model of a stablecoin issuer that faces a trade off between stability and profits, and with a key result being a bimodal equilibrium distribution, where in one of the modes the reserves are high and the peg is maintained. But in the second one of the modes, the reserves are low and the peg is not maintained. Um, I think this paper is very strong. Um, in particular, it's a state of the art model of cryptocurrency issue, issuance that is miles ahead of many other papers, especially papers that are coming from the practitioner space. Um, and it's grounded in this very contemporary theory of dynamic corporate cash management, which is very relevant because a lot of the actions that are taking um, place in digital assets happen near instantaneously. So having this continuous time framework is very helpful. And um, it also captures a very, very wide range of stablecoin issuers. So issuers that will profit from fees and from governance token issuance and from big data. And I think one very interesting result, which is very counterintuitive, is if you have an, a stablecoin issuer that profits from data, they might actually be less stable, which is not what my intuition would say, because they might be interested in lowering transactions and lowering reserves to attract more users. Now, some suggestions for improvement, potentially new work. Um, one of the key conceptual issues is that the, the backing coins, and by the way, this wasn't clear to me in the paper, it's more clear in the discussion, that the reserves that are used in, as a numerator in the paper um, are not dollars, right? Yeah, they're Bitcoin or Ethereum or other crypto assets. So what's happening with these over collateralized stable coins is somebody puts $150 worth of Bitcoin in a smart contract and they get a loan of $100 worth of stable coin. So what essentially they're doing is they're going long on Bitcoin and short on the stable coin. 
And one issue that I had with the math in the paper is that the price of Bitcoin and Ethereum has a Poisson jump component. So it's not necessarily a Brownian motion as modeled in the paper. And this is very relevant for things that happened, for example, in March 2020, when the price of Ethereum and Bitcoin crashed about 50% essentially overnight with the pandemic. Um, and this caused the debasement that you talked about, where the issuers of MakerDAO had to issue new governance tokens and dilute the equity share um, because they had to um, re-collateralize the stablecoins. And so having this Poisson jump component, it may introduce new equilibrium in the model that would capture some of the situations that have happened in real life. Um, something that I definitely learned from the paper is that this positive continuation value, this idea that there are these issues of stablecoin that want to keep the stablecoin going, might prevent this bad equilibrium from happening as happened in the pandemic crisis. Um, another suggestion for improvement is that and the model does not take into account competition between different stablecoins. So it assumes only one issuer with some control over fees and volatility. And in reality, um, entry costs are relatively low and stablecoin properties such as fees and volatility might be taken as dictated by the market, but stablecoins might compete on other dimensions such as privacy, counterparty risk, cybersecurity, ease of use. So one way to quantify this, which is a little bit outside of the model, is having some probability row of losing the entire value of the assets because of a bug or theft. Um, along a similar vein, um, the demand for stablecoins could be might profound. So right now it's just some like stream of utility that the user gets from holding stablecoins. And um, when people use this on the blockchain, a, a lot of the demand is coming from the desire to lend stablecoins to decentralized finance protocols. Um, and so for example, in September 2020, the price of the DAI stablecoin was 10% above par because of this high demand. And there could be a possible variation of the model where stablecoins are not necessarily um, risk-free assets, they're not yet right now, but instead of having this um, flow value of utility just by holding it, it could have some risk-reward profile which drives their demand. Um, another area for improvement could be taking the model to a data. So MakerDAO is relatively liquid stablecoin whose architecture is captured by the model. Fees go up and down sporadically over time. And there are also changes in policy. So for example, in pegging it to USD coin recently, but also changing from using only Ethereum as collateral to using Ethereum, Bitcoin, and other assets as collateral. So perhaps the authors could use this in a future paper to run an event study and estimate the elasticity of stablecoin demand versus fees. And finally, um, another area for improvement oh, um, could be um, looking at the effect of stablecoins on financial stability. So in particular, this uh, multi-collateral DAI that I mentioned, um, there was this recent development where this company, New Silver, used this tokenized mortgage-backed security, in particular the senior tranches, as collateral for, this, for the stablecoin. So this is a linkage between real estate and cryptocurrency markets. And it raises this very important question, which the authors can address with the framework of what are the implications for credit supply if we're going to use real assets for stable conditions. Um, thank you very much. I think there was a question in the comments, but we're also over time. All right. Uh, well, thank you uh, very much, Pablo. Um, and uh, if uh, you have time. To... Sorry. Yeah, so Francisco's question is not true for USDC, but it's true for MakerDAO. So, so MakerDAO is collateralized by Ethereum and Bitcoin um, exclusively. It's over collateralized. Perfect. Okay, thank, thank you, you. so much. Um, so we are at the end of uh, this session. We are uh, only one minute late, which uh, is wonderful. And uh, I, uh, the, the, the next uh, part of the program is the keynote presentation by uh, uh, Christine Parlor from uh, Berkeley Haas. And uh, unless Marty wants to jump in, I think Christine, you uh, are up. Okay, I'll take that as my um, um, license to present. <clears throat> I think in the program, um, this presentation is entitled uh, Open Banking and the Effect of Open Banking on Payments. And I'm going to 
to discuss a paper um, in that context that I've uh, worked with um, with Uday Rajan, who's my longtime collaborator, and Hao Zhang Zhu uh, from MIT. And basically, what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand uh, the implications uh, for welfare and the sort of real things that we care about for open banking. And in particular, what happens when you have fintech companies that compete for payment flows. And the intuition is really, really simple. So consumers um, have this need to make payments, and they also have a need for what we call loans, but you can think of as any kind of financial product. And what's true about payments, and this has sort of been in the literature, and, and this is sort of the way people think about it, is that payments and the cash flows that you observe about me tell me something about um, my credit quality. So essentially, um, these are gonna be informative about um, any kind of financial product that I wanna buy. And historically, banks, because they are the essentially custodians of funds and central to the payment system, Banks have basically had that information internally. Whether or not they used it as efficiently as they could, that's a different question. But certainly banks have had proprietary access to this information, and that has informed how they make loans. Now, what's happening? Well, now payments are still informative, but we're in a world where fintech and fintech companies potentially become the payment processors. So they either obscure the information that the bank has, or they internalize it in some way. And in particular, this competition breaks the link between um, the payment flows that banks have always had access to information about and uh, the financial products the banks want to issue. Okay. So another way of thinking about this or to sort of phrase the question is that historically banks have always provided a bundle of services, which is payments and also other ancillary financial uh, products. If they no longer provide that bundle, how do we want to think about that? Is that a good thing? So essentially, we have sort of two very focused questions. And the first is, if you have fintech competition in payments, is that a good thing? So, you know, the metrics that we use are the usual ones. Consumer welfare, does that go up or go down? Usually we think that competition automatically, because it reduces costs, um, is gonna make people better off. But in this world, there was a bundling of the two things and now given the unbundling, are consumers better off? And there are different ways of thinking about whether or not consumers are better off. And the ways are, you know, is the pricing of financial services, is that more or less efficient? So is their welfare from loan contracts higher or lower? What about payments markets? So um, if you think about payment processing, the people who remain at the bank, the people who go to the fintech, what is the relative welfare split across those two different groups? And finally, um, a question that we're all very interested in, which is, you know, if we think that there's um, if we think that the wrong person has information in the economy, is it possible to construct a market, essentially a missing market, to give that information back to the person who should be holding it, who uses it most efficiently? So um, essentially, we think about two different ways in which information could flow from the person who observes the, the data, the payments data and extracts uh, signals from it, it, we could think about a world in which the fintechs actually sell that data 
and or sell the uh, processing capacity to banks. We can think about that market. And you can also think about a market where instead of the data residing in the fintechs, the data actually belongs to the consumers so they can port it. So this is very much in line with how people uh, seem to be thinking about GDPR, PSD2, and so forth. It's that consumers have some sort of sovereignty over their data. What is the welfare effect of that? So what kinds of results do we come, come up with? Sort of what happens in this world? Well, sort of the most obvious one is that if you have fintech competition, it essentially reduces costs and it reduces the difficulty that some people have of accessing the payments market. Essentially, that leads to more financial inclusion. Um, essentially, consumers now have low cost access to electronic payments. And this is the sort of thing that we've seen, especially in Southeast Asia, where you've had just a massive adoption of electronic means of payment. So people now become essentially banked that were unbanked before. Another effect is that uh, the price of payments is going to be affected by this competition. And it turns out that if you have a discrete choice in the sense of I'm going to choose payment processor A or payment processor B in order to conduct my um, payments, um, in those kinds of models, in those kinds of frameworks, we don't necessarily think that competition always leads to lower prices. And in this environment as well, we're going to have that effect. So the introduction of fintechs competing, yes, they're going to reduce the cost for people who um, choose to use them as their payment provider. But for the people who remain with the banks and the traditional banking system, this in fact could increase the price of payments. Um, and this is just because essentially um, the, the fact that some people go away to fintech companies changes the price elasticity of demand that the bank faces and bang, the price can go up. Um, what about loan markets? Well, it turns out that when you unbundle payments and um, uh, financial services, you can get some, um, some sort of somewhat strange effects. And um, this is because the change in the bank's information set, so what it knows about consumers, fundamentally affects how much loan surplus there are, there is. So essentially it affects the uh, quantity of loans that it uh, produces or that it makes. And it also affects the split of the surplus between the bank and the consumers. So these are sort of nuanced effects. And basically it comes from disrupting this bundle of payment services and uh, financial services. What happens if you add a data market? What happens if you add a, what is potentially a missing market? Well, if information flows back to the person who is making the loan, which in our framework is going to be the bank, um, this is going to essentially make the loan market more informative. So uh, total surplus goes up. Absolutely. What about consumers? So, uh, well, if there is a data market, then it's going to be the case that some consumers benefit and some consumers are worse off. And what we were sort of surprised by, but then on reflection, it sort of makes sense. If you have an environment in which consumers own their own data and they port it, um, essentially this allows banks to partially infer their type. And in particular, in our framework, it's going to be the case that consumer welfare is always better, weekly better or strictly better um, with a data market where data is explicitly monetized and sold than with data portability where consumers own their own data. So um, there is literature and it's just growing really fast and it's now sort of, um, you know, people are obviously, these are, these are current topics that people are very interested in. Um, so there's an older literature that says that uh, 
payments data are informative about credit quality. And you know whether or not banks use it efficiently, that's a different question. But we do think that payments tell us something about what the underlying credit uh, type type is. Um, more recently, there's a literature on banking. So people have started to think about what happens when fintechs compete with banks. And um, you know this is still a, a very, very nascent literature. So what is our framework? Just to sort of fix ideas, how are we thinking about the world? Um, there's a representative bank that offers both payment processing and loans. When you can think about a bank, you should think about any entity that is bundled. So the, the key element here is that payments and loans are bundled in this environment. Competing with that are going to be two identical fintech firms. The reason why we do this is just so that we don't actually have to worry about strategic interaction between the fintechs. And essentially, we just know exactly what price they're going to offer services at because they compete in a Bertrand fa fashion. But you can think about this as any sort of uh, technology enabled payment system. What about consumers? Um, there's a uh, unit mass of consumers, and each consumer gets some benefit from having access to electronic payments. And consumers differ along a particular dimension, which is their repayment probability. So this is essentially the credit risk. So this is what information is going to be worthwhile to sort of figure out. And in addition, each consumer conditional on their credit type has we, what we call a bank affinity. So this is just an extra utility that comes from using the bank to process payments. We're pretty agnostic about what this is, this distribution actually represents, partially because uh, pretty much every single country has their different, um, um, has sort of different demographic characteristics that imply um, a different affinity towards banks. So, uh, for example, for people who have trouble accessing a formal banking system, you can think about this affinity distribution as representing a distance to a physical bank. For countries that have an older population, you could think about this affinity distribution as people who are less technologically savvy and so really, really appreciate having the possibility of a physical banking environment. So to some extent, we think that this is an empirical issue, which is why we have this flexible form. But once again, I'd like to point out that it is conditional on the repayment probability. So what is the world that we're working in? In the first period, uh, banks and fintech firms each choose uh, a price for their payment services. The consumer then privately observes their type which comprises their repayment probability and how much they like the bank, and they choose a payment processor. Then each consumer is hit by the need for a loan, a liquidity shock, if you will, that's with some constant probability across all types. Then the bank offers a menu, um, which, co which comprises a quantity of a loan quantity and a loan price. The reason why the bank is offering the menu is because the bank is uninformed, right? The consumers know their own type. So the bank is essentially screening. It knows that there are these different people out there and it uses the information it has essentially to maximize its profits. Then in the last period, the consumer either repays or defaults. So what is information? This is sort of fundamental to the story, so how do we want to think about it? Well, you can think about the information through the payment flows as essentially giving the bank a signal about this really important financial variable, which is their repayment probability. So in particular, um, the, uh, the signal um, is informative and it depends on this alpha parameter. So to some extent, alpha is going to capture the bank's ability to extract information from uh, the signal. 
So this is going to be useful when we think about maybe the fintechs having a better alpha than the banks. So uh, just if you look at our formulation of the signal structure, if alpha is equal to one, then uh, the bank is completely useless at getting information. So it's just noise. And as alpha gets bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, basically it becomes easier and easier and easier to infer the type. And obviously is the bank as an uninformed party, figuring out who to offer what contract to is gonna be very important. So just to sort of as a benchmark, let's think about first best. That's always sort of a useful place to start. And um, the first best sort of illustrates how we're thinking about people's util utility. So um, if a consumer has a certain repayment probability and they expect, accept a specific loan that's got a quantity Q and a rate R, their utility is what? Well, the utility depends on the size of the loan and some A. What is this A? You can think of this as essentially what the money is going to be used for. Right? They have to repay the loan, so that sort of reduces their overall utility. And in addition, we have this convex term, which we sort of threw in just to make the screening part work a little bit better. The way you can think about this intuitively is that there's going to be some cost associated with default. So in a more dynamic model, you could think about this cost as being a reputation cost. You can think about this as being a hit to your credit report, all these sorts of other reasons why people might not want to just default. What about the bank? Well, basically the bank makes money from the loan, which depends on the interest rate and the quantity. It also, the bank's profits also depend on whether or not it gets repaid. Um, in addition, the bank has a cost of capital. Once again, this is very effective or this makes our screening problem much easier. In this world, we can figure out exactly what the first best is. And the first best has the right kinds of uh, characteristics. So in particular, if somebody is more likely to repay, essentially you wanna give them a higher quantity. Um, you wanna give them a, a much more than somebody who has a lower ability to repay. So the first best sort of looks the way we might think it should work. Um, just to sort of re reiterate what's going to go on here, the bank doesn't exactly observe the consumer's type, so it's offering a screening menu. And what's going to be important for our wealth, understand our welfare effects, is that the um, the menu that it offers depends on the overall amount of information that it has about all consumers, right? And its beliefs about what the world looks like is going to be determined by, uh, you know, the set of consumers who use it for payments and also the specific information that it has about uh, the customer. So what does an uninformed bank do? Well, an uninformed bank has a classic screening problem. They basically try and maximize their profits as all good profit maximizers do. And in addition, they have a couple of constraints. They wanna make sure that the type who is high um, accepts the right contract. They wanna make sure that the uh, type who is low accepts the right contract. So these are incentive compatibility constraints. And they want to make sure that the participation constraints are also satisfied. So they want to make sure that they actually get the business. So it turns out that you can sort of structure the optimal contract in this environment. And what happens? Well, it turns out that basically the people who have the bad repayment probability, so the low types, um, essentially in all the contracts that we characterize, these guys get zero surplus. They are driven down to their participation constraint. And intuitively, we sort of think that the people who are um, on the lower side of the income scale and I'm sort of saying that that's sort of correlated with repayment probability, these guys don't actually get a good outcome in the, in the loan market or by doing business with banks. 
The other thing that's true about all the co contracts that we characterize is that the incentive compatibility of the high type binds. So all the action in this model is going to be about adjusting the contract to the low guy um, so that the high guy basically does what the bank wants it to do so the bank can get as much surplus as it possibly can. Um, so the, the high guy gets the quantity, the first best quantity, but the low guy's quantity is distorted downward. And this is just to ensure that the high type picks the right contract. Okay. So all the action is in try is the bank trying to adjust its product mix, um, essentially so that it can extract as much surplus as possible from the high type and making sure that the high type actually does take the contract that the bank wants them to take. And this is going to be the source of inefficiency in the model. Okay, so just as a re quick recap, the loan type obtains zero surplus in the, in the loan market. The low type's quantity is distorted downward, and the interest rate is chosen to satisfy uh, their um, uh, IR constraint, their participation constraint. The high type obtains the first best quantity, and the interest rate they get, which essentially determines the split with the bank, is chosen to satisfy their incentive compatibility constraint. Okay. And intuitively, once again, the bank is just trying to extract as much as it possibly can from the high type. All right, so how do payments flow into this problem? What happens when you bundle? Um, well, first of all, when you think about banks setting their payments uh, uh, price for their payment services. And so this price can include, you know, um, the fact that you don't get a direct pass through on prime rates and so forth. So the, the, the price should be interpreted in that context. It's sort of a, a wide variety of things that pay people pay for either explicitly or implicitly. Um, so the bank has to think about two things. One, um, if it changes its payments price, that's a direct revenue impact. Two, if it changes its payments price, that's going to affect uh, the set of consumers who choose the bank, which is going to choose change its information structure, which is going to change its ability to extract rents later on if people actually want to um, get a loan. So the bank has to think about both of these things when it uh, sets its payment price. Right? And um, how, does the, how does it do it? Well, basically, it just says, OK, I know that there's a distribution out there of people who have a bank affinity as a function of their repayment probability. I'm going to figure out how much utility they get from uh, coming to me as a bank. I'm going to figure out how much utility they get from their next best option. So, for example, suppose that it's cash. The amount of utility they'd get is just how much loan, uh, how much loan surplus they would get if they were uninformed. And the bank figures out the consumer who is indifferent between these two choices. And so the bank chooses a price, given that it can figure out what its derived demand is, um, and chooses a, uh, ooh, um, and chooses uh, a price. And the price essentially determines a cutoff individual. Individuals above that cutoff, they're with a higher bank affinity, are going to bank with the bank. Individuals below that cutoff um, are going to go to the fintech company. Okay. So the first thing to notice in this framework, and I'm not going to go through all the mechanics, which get a little bit hairy. So first of all, if you have a discrete choice model, which is I can either go to do my business with firm A or do my business with firm B. It turns out that if you have competition between firms, it's not the case that competition always decreases all prices in the market. And this is strictly a characteristic of discrete choice models. And essentially what happens is um, if one side of the market changes their price and reduces it, 
The other side is basically facing a trade-off between also reducing their price and essentially having a retaining the size of their market share, or the fact that now the people who are still uh, doing business with them have potentially a lower price elasticity. So there's the opportunity of increasing your price on that residual demand curve. And so we have this effect going on as well. So in the face of fintech competition, you can actually get very robust cases where the price of payment services offered by the banks actually increase. Okay. Um, so, you know, what happens in this market? Well, you can get a higher price of payments and that hurts welfare directly. It also changes uh, the set of people who go to the bank, which also changes the type of contracts that the bank offers in the loan market. And basically this affects the informational rent that the, the bank gets. And you can find very robust cases um, where the loan market outcomes for the high credit type consumers can actually decrease or increase after fintech entry. So in terms of welfare surplus in the loan market, it's very, very ambiguous what effect fintech entry is going to have overall on the types of outcomes in, um, in, in banks loan making. So we've sort of been through a lot. So what have we got sort of got so far? So fintech entry into payments, so picking off the payments part of banks' business model, has a couple of implications. One, financial inclusion. That's a big thumbs up. So people before who couldn't really, um, didn't want to bank with the banks because they didn't have a high bank affinity or it was costly for them to go to the bank, uh, basically now they're better off for sure. Uh, price of payment services, the bundle that the banks offer, this can actually go up. So it doesn't necessarily unambiguously lead to an increase in consumer welfare. Some people can be worse off. What about loan market surplus? Um, you can have people who are better off or, or worse off as a result of this uh, disruption in the information channel, right? So overall, FinTech competition is not clearly uh, unambiguously a good thing. So in the last couple of minutes, just I want to sort of say, you know, what implications does this have for um, essentially constructing an, a, another market, a potentially missing market that allows information to flow from the fintech company back to the bank? How would we do that? And what are the welfare implications? And there are two ways that we think about this. One is direct sales. So you could think about the fintech companies bundling the information they have about uh, their payment customers and selling that to the banks if the banks decide that they want to buy that because they, they're thinking about making that consumer a loan, right? So this is sort of like alternate credit uh, types of venues. The other case that we think about is data portability. Um, so this is a case where consumers own their own data so they can choose to go to the fintech company for payments processing, and they can then retain a credible uh, document about their payment history and then supply it to the bank if they want to actually get a loan from the bank. So just in terms of the timeline in the model, um, the, the sequence essentially is exactly the same as it was before, but in addition, I add this sort of extra step which is there's some sort of market going on, right? Um, and in the case of data sales, the bank and the fintech companies are going to agree on a price ex ante. Then all the action happens, consumers choose their payment providers and the whole model rolls forward. Okay, so let's sort of think intuitively about what would happen if there was a data sales um, market. So if the fintech company could provide, uh, could sell data to the bank, well, what's going to happen? Um, well, 
so um, the, clearly the bank is going to be better informed. Um, and the surplus that the bank gets because it's better informed, this is going to go up. So the bank has a value for the data. Now, who is going to get that value is sort of going to depend, is going to affect welfare. So the bank could get that value or the fintech company could get that value. And that's just going to effectively determine the price that the fintech company charges the bank for the data. Okay. Um, if it is in fact the case that the bank pays the fintech company for the data, because the fintech companies are competing in providing payment services, essentially that uh, rent that they get from the, from the data and the data sales is going to feed back into the services that they provide the consumers who uh, go to them for payments. So this is the freemium model and all these sorts of other things that we, we get from our technology companies. So essentially, if the fintech company is selling data to the bank, essentially those rents that the banks get from being better informed and that they're willing to pay for flow back to the consumers who are using the fintech company for payments. Um, so what is the implication of having this extra market tacked on top of our sort of original framework? Um, well, first of all, overall loans, loan market surplus goes up because the bank is better informed. The lender is better informed. Um, because some of the profits that the fintech company gets uh, from selling data to the bank flow back to consumers, the consumers who are using the fintech company are actually going to be better off. They get a better price for their services. They essentially uh, get their data monetized in some way. Um, in terms of the loan market, well, now the bank is better informed, it's better able to screen, and it can essentially tighten the screws on the people who come to the loans. So the people who don't get their data, the benefit of their data flowing back to them through the payment uh, pricing channel, essentially can be worse off. So um, data sales, once again, are not a panacea, and they can hurt people who basically uh, get a reduced surplus in their essentially bargaining with the bank. What about data portability? What if consumers own their own data? And so uh, they can then go to the bank and then if they need a loan, they can just present this in a credible way. Um, well, now there's a problem, right? So um, the bank is faced with people who may or may not share data with them. Well, of course, the bank is going to draw inferences um, about that, those, those people. And this is a pretty robust intuition. So the bank um, could essentially you know, offer the low uh, repayment probability types a toaster, you know, a free, free chocolate bars. And because they're essentially getting zero surplus, they'll be quite happy to provide any information that they have about themselves um, and they'll give it to the bank. The, this allows the bank to essentially, essentially get a signal about the people who don't want to share data with them for free. So this is almost like a data externality. If some people are willing to share their, their data, in particular their credit data, the people who don't share are pretty much pigeonholed as being the types who are don't you know have a have a um, an economic uh, foundation, if you will, for privacy. And essentially, the reason in our model why they have that is because if they keep their information private, they can probably get better terms in the loan market. For the people who get bad terms anyway, they're quite happy to tell the bank everything. And so the bank is essentially um, extracting uh, a, a signal from the fact that people don't want to provide their data. Another way of thinking about this is if you have a data sales market, um, it's, it, it works in a very, very particular way. So if there's a data sales market, effectively the fintech companies are bargaining with the bank. 
and the fintech park mar companies have market power. If you have data portability, each consumer individually is negotiating with the bank and consumers have absolutely no market power. So in our framework, what that means is that when you have data portability and consumers own their own data, they're essentially through hook or by crook, they're giving that information for free to the bank. Essentially, it's a data market where the price that the consumer gets is forced to zero. So pretty much in any, uh, any environment, consumers are going to, their welfare is going to be higher or weakly higher in the sort of knife edge case in which the fintech company is actually negotiating uh, the data sales with the bank. So data sales um, are a, um, a case with essentially data portability with a positive price. Another way of saying that is uh, data portability or data sales where the consumers get absolutely no price in the data market. So consumers are worse off. So um, what have we talked about here? So what does this framework uh, deliver? So, um, you know, payment data um, contain information about credit and who supplies the payment processing essentially determines who gets that information. And if you have competition in payment processing, so standalone payment processors, um, this is obviously going to reduce the amount of information that banks get. And because it's going to reduce the information that banks get, it's going to affect their ability to price other financial services. Um, and in particular, uh, some people can be worse off, some people can be better off. Obviously, if you have fintech competition and lower cost payments, for people who have a high cost of going to a bank, so in our framework, that would be like a negative bank affinity, uh, this is going to be a good thing, of course, right? They're going to get something for free that they couldn't get before for a very low price. For some people, they're going to be worse off. Either the price of their payments is going to increase or the amount of surplus that they get in the loan market is going to decrease. Finally, when it comes to, you know, do we want to organize some sort of missing market and allow um, um, and allow that mar the, the information to flow to uh, the, the party who is actually going to be producing these financial products. Um, if you have a world where there's a data sale market, uh, in our framework, that's going to be better for consumers uh, than, a, than a framework where consumers actually own their own data. And it just comes down to an issue of bargaining power. If consumers own their own data, they don't have bargaining power. If a fintech holds consumers data, they're much better able to bargain with the bank. And um, if they're competing, business model. So one of the interesting things for me about fintech and fintech in general is that we have a whole bunch of firms that were bundles of particular services. So banks, as far as I can tell, they offer custodial services, they offer payments, and they offer financial services. Now we're in a world that because of the sort of lower cost of, um, of financial services or the lower cost of, of technology, uh, we have fintech companies that are picking off each of those individuals, each of those individual functions. And the question is, if you once had an economic entity that internalized um, the, the, the benefits and the costs of, of performing all these functions and they no longer internalize it, can we actually solve any problems that might arise through a market solution? And that's sort of our, uh, our perspective. Yeah, Christine, I think that the question was directed to the proposition, of course, it's outside of your model, but the proposition that fintechs are potentially uh, providing new services that banks were not providing 
before, maybe because they didn't have an incentive or because they can't. Um, I don't know, for example, using the data, the same data for um, liquidity management of, of the household or, or, or services like those. Uh, and those must be valuable to the household as well, right? But that's not in, in your model, but just wanted to, to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so in our in our model, the, the benefit of electronic payments is fixed um, at V. We have this, this one variable, um, and it doesn't really matter if that's offered by a bank or a fintech. Yes, you could absolutely think about a world where uh, the fintechs offer other services and they sort of give a welfare uh, bump up. But once again, um, if the, the fintechs then become a bundle of two different services, that's a whole different beast. And for, you know, there are going to be some people who stay with the bank and are going to be potentially worse off, and some people who go to the fintechs are potentially better off, but have an even larger uh, incremental increase in utility. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so I have my, I hope you can hear me now. So we had a small, small glitch in the, in the technicalities here, but uh, I was very happy to see that the discussion started and went, went on. So it seems that you were able to, to hear each other and at least the chat work. Yeah. So, so perfect. So we can continue that. I mean, I had one, one, one question in mind on, on my side. I want, because I was um, thinking uh, when you were explaining this, uh, this say data market and data portability models. So um, thinking about it in, in Europe, well, where we have this GDPR and, um, and PSD2, as, as you referred to, I'm just wondering, like, uh, does it really imply that uh, it must go into a situation where, where the, the customer has all the responsibility of, of bargaining with the bank? I mean, mm -hmm. in my understanding, it, uh, I mean, it gives the right for, for the customer to, because he or she has the ownership on the data and, and go and request it. But more or less, we see that it hasn't changed much. The data still resides on the place where it used to be in the, in the past. So I, I kind of don't recognize the, the setup which you described where the data would only, only locate at the customer uh, who would need to then bring it to some place and ask, does this have any value? If you um, I mean the, the ooh, I'm echoing. The very cheap answer to your question is that um, if it is in fact the world where consumers um, know that if they remove the data from the place where it is and they use it to get financial services elsewhere, they're going to be worse off. They're not going to do it. So uh, empirically, you're never presumably you're never going to observe that. The, the reason why we have this very sort of stark, um, you know, consumers actually walk around with their data um, is because there's certainly, there seems to be a policy push towards ensuring that consumers have uh, complete control of their data. And the idea, um, you know, data sovereignty, the, the, the idea that uh, it's always going to be better for the consumers if they own this and they control it. Um, our framework sort of says, we might want to think about that carefully. Um, it's outside our uh, model because our focus is sort of on the banks. Uh, but you could think about a world where um, the social planner um, actually has some sort of data repository and negotiates on behalf of the consumer with potential financial service providers, um, and so eliminates the um, this sort of uh, imbalance of power. Right. So that would be sort of an interesting uh, an interesting uh, policy thing to think through. I think. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. That, that's actually I, I well recognized how you describe the. The setup now, now in, in your answer, so that that kind of matches much more what I what I see, possibly here, when the regulations have been put in place and we actually don't seem to see so much uh, of uh, this kind of bargaining or data portability happening. At least that's my impression. Yeah. 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 
But I saw there were good, good questions already. Francesco raised some. Uh, feel free. The, the floor is uh, open for, for others as well. Any thoughts uh, raised uh, by, by the speech? Yes, this is uh, Jamie McAndrews. Uh, wonderful, wonderful paper, Christine. And I was wondering, to what extent would you think your results would apply to a central bank digital currency? Thanks so much. Um, so CBDC obviously takes many different forms. If you think about the sort of DCEP that um, appears to be in operation in China, that's got a programmable aspect to it. So that is a bundle of both payments and uh, information. So uh, in that case, the central bank is acting like a bank in our, in our framework. If you think about a world where the CBDC doesn't have a programmable aspect to it, um, which are sort of um, yeah, m more along the lines of, you know, stable coins or USDC or whatever, um, then it becomes a lot more like just cash. Um, you can't uh, see where it's been or which, you know, wallet to wallet it goes to. Um, so it very, very much de depends on uh, the design um, and what and what sort of functional characteristics the CBDC has. Great, thank, thank you. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm just asking here if I have the mic. Uh, it's uh, as this the funny uh, the Finnish um, Finnish uh, silence, which we are comfortable for having long time without being feeling awkward at all. But uh, <laughs> the thanks, thanks for the good questions. Um, there's still still the floor is open, but uh, but I think uh, I think everyone wants dinner. It could be, and actually, given that it's it's um, coming to the close of the of the second day, I think uh, it would be fair to say that uh, if we would have had the possibility of having this this uh, event as a live event here in Helsinki, this would have been the the moment when we would have uh, been very happy to invite you all for a nice dinner. I was actually planning to take a walk and and take a picture of the restaurant uh, we were planning yes last year for this event but um, yesterday it was raining a bit heavily so i i missed that uh, opportunity but um, anyway as as they say it, it was um, intended or planned so you can consider that uh, while you need to now have your dinner locally by yourself this evening <clears> or <throat> oh, lunch indeed depends on the time zone <laughs> For us, it's a dinner, definitely. But uh, it seems there there are not so much questions. Uh, I very much enjoyed the the, the keynote and 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 the discussion and the, and the answers uh, we had here uh, on this this moment. It was great to have a possibility for this kind of interactive session as well. That's uh, something I've been a bit missing in uh, in the in the format. Uh, now we've had very packed uh, presentations on the on the sessions. So I think we can uh, now say big thanks for Christine and for also for the other speakers and discussions of, of the second day and, uh, and consider the, the second day formally to be ready. And uh, we will continue tomorrow the formally, uh, the, the, the program um, starting three o'clock Helsinki time as, as before. Then we will have uh, the second keynote presenter to begin, because um, he is uh, from European time zone, we will we'll have then uh, uh, Dirk Niepel to, to start the day tomorrow. But um, this concludes us for the second day.
Parasa, and um, thanks for the contributions. And um, see you tomorrow. And uh, we can close the recording uh, here, and then we have in the schedule still the informal session uh, on which we can continue and uh, have still questions if you didn't want to raise some, some questions um, under the taping or on the, on the record, as they say. <laughs>